Hey, everybody, welcome to Dooner's World. I'm your host, Mike Dooner Muldoon, broadcasting live for the first time from Mayapac, New York. Hope everybody's doing well this Thursday night. Uh, things are going well. Oh, geez. oh, I'm broadcasting on my own laptop. <laughs> So hope everyone's doing well tonight. First time live streaming. First show of season two. Uh, I got Darren Bruce coming in in a few minutes, uh, host of the DJ sessions. Um, he's been doing this for 10 years or so, hosting live YouTube shows and whatnot. So I can't wait to talk to him. Um, so so thankful for all the people that helped me with season one. Um, first off, thanks to my wife for, for putting up with me. It was a crazy year, uh, 160 shows in, in nine months. Um, so thanks to her. Um, also thanks to um, Hadley Wolfram. Right from Chipster PR, helped me out a lot. Uh, Melissa Kurasek um, from Moxie Publicity, and also Kevin Higgins. Thanks a lot to all of them for um, helping me out with season one and, and season two. Looking forward to booking your guests and keeping it going on. Uh, looks like we got Darren joining in in just a minute, which is cool. Let me see if we can get him. Hey, Darren, you there? Oh, I, am I on? Well, I hear you, but I don't see you. Wait, hang on. Let me do this. There we go probably don't have the right microphone set up before. I've never used Restream Studio before. You know, I'm new to it too, brother. I'm new to it too. So we'll get through this together. It's funny. I was just saying, oh, you've been doing this for so long. No, you know, and it, new tools come along, right? Um, no, I, I talk about Restream to all my, all people yeah. I use. It. I just have never done an interview in it before. So uh, I thought we were doing Zoom or something else. Right. So, well, I switched it on you. I did switch it on you, right? So my whole first season, I used Zoom, but um, now I'm switching okay. over to uh, Restream. Now that I'm with George at Count Zero, oh, forgot to thank George from Count Zero. Um, you know, streaming live through his channels, and I'm uh, gonna be working with him a lot this year. Very excited about that. Awesome, yeah. Um, I definitely. Oh, hey, look at. Okay, you know what? I need to figure out how to turn my camera on for this. And here's the settings, video resolution, video input, uh, FaceTime HD camera. Look at this. Oh, hey, look at that. Yes. Okay, um, and we are gonna go <laughs> to a better microphone. That'll be. Uh... All right. All right. This is working. We got this going on. <laughs> so you, you're live right now, streaming your show. Yeah, live. we're live streaming. Yeah, man. You're, awesome. you're, you're the, this is the first show of my second season. So all welcome. right. Welcome, I'm man. digging it. I'm digging it. Let me, uh, all right. There we go. A little better, a little better lighting here in the studio. Yeah. And, oh, uh, oh, you're getting cut off. Your head's cut off. There we go. There we go. <laughs> hey, everyone. <laughs> How you doing, brother? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. How are you all doing out there? We, East Coast, right? East Coast, New York, buried in snow. But, um, you know, welcome to Dooner's World. It's nice and warm in here. Um, and I'm ready to have a fun conversation with you, brother. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so you're out in Seattle or near Seattle? Uh, we're in, I'm, I'm in the heart of the city. Oh, like cool. literally downtown Seattle. Oh, right and um, yeah, we basically are having our yearly snowmageddon here which is means little light flurries of snow that the whole town starts freaking out about which really will amount to nothing right eventually <laughs> but nothing like what y'all having back there right now you say new york style is two mondays ago we got 18 inches and it, over oh, wow. like a, t a day and a half or two days and then we got eight inches two or three days ago and like a dusting of three inches last night <laughs> yeah it's not <laughs> like, like that out here yeah 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 so have you always been out in seattle you grew up there I have been, yeah, born and raised uh, in, in Seattle area. Um, I live kind of all over the place up here, but uh, I've been, yes, yeah, I'm actually you know, very fine. Very few of us up here that are actually born, raised, and still live here. Right, uh, true Washingtonian, a true Seattleite. Uh, I love the city. There's only like maybe two other cities I'd go to if I was going to move. San Francisco being one of them. Um, I just always love it down there. The weather's nice. It's mm -hmm. California. Yeah. What's the other one? Chicago. Chicago. I, I was thinking yeah. Toronto for some reason. Toronto's a really nice city I've been to. It's a little I've cool. heard it. It's beautiful Toronto. there. Yeah. Yeah. That's one city I could see. I could see. Well, if I went to Canada, I guess. But <laughs> <laughs> So you're about my age and I'm curious. Um, when I was in high school, I was so enthralled by everything that was going on out in your world, right? Um, so I, I grew up, you know, tons of uh, New York Dolls. Hello, nominated for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Uh, the Ramones, you know, all that punk rock. But you know, once I started hearing Mud Honey and Tad and Soundgarden and then, you know, Nirvana, uh, mm -hmm. it just changed me. You know, I joined the Sub Pop Singles Club and like, you know, I was I was changed. So what was going on with you in high school? Were you have you impacted by the scene? Because you, were you know, um, my brothers were musicians uh, mm -hmm. when I was growing up. So they were into the rock. I mean, they were Black Sabbath, you know, yeah. uh, you know, Led Zeppelin, Pink Floyd, all of that stuff. And then definitely punk rock. They had punk rock bands. 
Um, one of my brothers, he played the guitar. The other brother wrote and sung the songs with their friends. They put together a, a, a band and, and my dad older lavished of the brothers older than you were younger. Yeah, they were oh, older than me. Okay. And, um, and so my dad lavished affection on them by basically, I grew up with eight track recorders, studio equipment, gear, keyboards. And that was my, I was the tech guy. And I was, I actually went into video. I love, my dad had the video camera. I played with the video camera. They were musicians. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, in the nineties, I would kind of, I mean, throughout that time, I kind of gravitated a little bit more towards, um, hip hop rap music, sure. uh, beastie boys, uh, licensed ill tour was the first concert I ever went to. Oh, tell it's me about it. Tell me. I love the beast. That's another New York. Yeah. Love the beasties. Licensed yeah. ill tour. Oh, opening for Madonna or no, uh, no, it's not opening. Headline. No, they, uh, they headlined and they were, um, they uh, had Fishbone open up for him here at the Ooh, Paramount. Oh, that's hot. That was yeah. I liked that's Fishbone hot. at the time too. They had a really. I liked their music, and uh, but Beastie Boys, yeah, just kind of that's what I gravitated towards. And then a little bit more into the the LL Cool J, you know, more of the Def Jam, DMC, DMC, right? And uh, never got. I didn't get into to real gangster hip hop music or even anything like that until my brother one day played for me a, a Too Short. And uh, the the hip hop artist out of, of the Oakland Bay Area, mm -hmm. and um, I just was enthralled with it. I just gravitated towards hip hop, and I mean, everyone else in the world was. You're right, grabbing the Pearl Jam, grabbing. The, I, I had some Red Hot uh, Chili Peppers, you know. Just thinking back at old CDs that I had, I had Soundgarden. I had, you know, um, oh gosh, I remember I went to the store and I bought four of them. I had Nirvana, Nevermind, Red Hot Chili Blood. Blood Sugar, Sex Magic, mm -hmm. Sound Gardens, was that Bad Mortarfinger? Yeah, bad Mortarfinger. Bad Mortarfinger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, Pearl Jam 10, I think. Sure. Was, sure. Well, There's was a like, fistful. There's a fistful. Yeah. So, I mean, I was listening to that stuff, but I again, I was more into the dance club stuff in that mm -hmm. sense. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it, it was it was the rise of God put us on the map musically and had a lot of people out here, you know enthralled with the seattle grunge sound which yeah yeah it's funny even as i was going through that i still had cypress hill i still had dmc mm -hmm. i still you know it's it's i saw the beasties on the check your head tour yeah. uh one of the best shows rollins band opened for them which was just it was phenomenal nice yeah actually it was a funny story i was walking outside the show i was like 15 or so and uh I see this beautiful woman, like a blonde, gorgeous. And I'm like, oh my God, she's gorgeous. And I look down and there's Henry Rollins holding her hand. Right? It was just, I was like, oh my God. But he was like, I got scared. I remember like Henry scared me outside that show. You and know then, it's, oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I was gonna say, it's so funny you bring up Rollins because I just was talking about somebody, about him like either earlier today, yesterday or today. And I had an experience where I, I actually met him. I got, uh, I was working with a cannabis company and we were down in Denver, Colorado for the 420 meetup down there, the big cannabis convention they have. Wow. And he was walking through the crowd. And the guy that was the CEO of the company that I was with, he had a cam I had a camera crew with him. I said, dude, you know, you know who that guy is over there, right? And he goes, No, I don't know. I go, that's that's freaking Henry Rollins, man. Let's go get an interview with him. So he goes, Okay, he didn't even know who he was, which just blew my mind. I'm just sitting there going, ah, yeah, hi, Henry Rollins. This is awesome. You know, well, that's not a place for him, too, because he's not he's not a, a drinker or partaker in in any of that a supporter but not a you know that's yeah makes him so much more awesome <laughs> <laughs> yeah he was a really cool guy though I yeah mean, just really chill and cool but uh yeah you mentioned that it's just kind of weird that it's come up twice the rollins maybe there's something knocking on my door so the universe is trying to tell me something well have you ever seen his interview series he does amazing interviews uh, I, i've old. watched stuff yeah a long time ago you won't find any more anyone more passionate about music than henry rollins he's it's yeah it's great to see him turn into like a little schoolgirl when he talks about like the bad brains <laughs> or you know that stuff it's a, you know i love that i love that about him uh you ever you ever see him in concert i have not uh no, no again no. i i grab it what what happened in my musical shift if we can get back to that i started getting into uh there was the hip hop top 40 stuff that was going on, but then I started going out. I went to my first nightclub when I was 18 years old. Well, I should say I was going to nightclubs before that, but my first underground nightclub. Right. And uh, kind of got just hooked to the dance floor and electronic music and kind of just started making that shift to electronic dance mm. music, um, mm -hmm. you know, and then following that whole genre and going to the massive raves and, and dressing up like a candy kid and, you know, and I rolled out of the sound factory like five, six a.m. and walked through Central Park a couple times. Back in my day. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I would have loved to. Have, it was another big one in New York. The club. Yeah, I would have loved to have made it back to some of those places. I think yeah. that would have just been phenomenal <laughs> and awesome. And so, you know, one of the things I, I'm looking forward to is obviously when this all goes, I want to go to Europe, 
get around the world. Kind of a little, I, I love my city. I love where I'm from, but I know every back door, green room, yeah, alleyway, every single hidden nook and cranny and every single one of these nightclubs here in Seattle. Yeah, and I'm kind of yeah. just like, I want to go somewhere else. I got to see some other stuff. So I have a friend of mine, he's from London and he's like, just come with me, mate. And go. And I'm like, yeah. yeah. Pent up, pent up, you know, need for excitement and, <clears throat> and new sights and sounds and smells and mm -hmm. taste flavors and all that. So I want to get back to when you saw the Beastie Boys again at this show. Tell me some yeah. more details because that's crazy. I remember when, um, I remember my friend's dad was a teacher in Manhattan and he came back with License to Ill like the day it came out. Mm -hmm. like, it, it changed everybody, right? It, it didn't matter if you were listening to Metallica or The Grateful Dead. You, like, everybody in New York was listening to the Beastie Boys when that came mm -hmm. out. And I think that obviously spread around the country. Uh, yeah, I, I had a copy of the tape and I listened to it uh, over and over and over again the night before the concert. Yeah. And um, how old were you? Uh, 86. I think it was 86, 80, 86 or 87. Because well, they came back. The following year, they came back with Run DMC. Yeah, and I went and saw that one and had got got to kind of meet them all and everything. Um, just briefly, they had a little kind of meet and greet after the show. And um, but you know, I think the Beastie Boys definitely changed my life. I was actually just talking with somebody recently about Paul's Boutique and how phenomenal of an album that was. And I was I was just in another interview with somebody. Can't remember exactly the basic context of it was that somehow it just got overshadowed and they are from east coast they're from the east coast too mm -hmm. and what they were talking about is kind of what overshadowed it was nwa had come out with their album and sure. it was like something that just straight out of compton or something came out and just kind of you didn't hear much of a peep about paul's boutique i mean and they were talking about some of the hit songs on like hey ladies obviously got commercial play and uh shake your rump was definitely one of those ones that that, that came out but it just kind of got this back seat. But it was know, I remember not connecting um, with that right when it came out. I connected with it after, and now I think it's one of the best ever. But I remember feeling that. I remember not really, yeah. you know, because the license deal was something. This was it was West Coast Dust Brothers. You know, it was just a different vibe. Um, and then it felt like Check Your Head was like a comeback album, right? Yeah. But in a lot of ways. Um, but now you look back and you're like, geez, over 200 samples. It's ge it's genius. It's it's well, flat out that's, that's what somebody was talking to me about. Oh, it was it was was it Cut Chemist? I think it was Cut Chemist. Yeah, I think it was Cut Chemist I was talking to, and he goes, um, the crazy thing about that is they did something where they sampled Beatles songs or something. And he goes, I can, he's been sampling for 30 years. He's like, I can usually pick up and know exactly where that came from. And he goes, they were using some stuff I couldn't even place. Mm -hmm. I don't know where they were getting it from. And I mean, yeah, it was, it was really awesome. Talking ahead of to its time. It was obviously just yeah. way ahead of its time. None way of, ahead of its time. None of us could wrap our heads around it when it came well, out. <laughs> and then on top of it, the album itself, you, you had the kind of like the college party boy album drinking Budweiser's to now this kind of serious musician album that I don't think people were ready to have dropped on them. You know, well, and also I think, you know, rap at that time was almost like heavy metal. It was the outcast. It wasn't really accepted. And that heavy sampling back then people were offended by that. You know, mm -hmm. people didn't really dig that. You know, I was like listening to Slayer as much as sampling was, you know, all crap, right? So it was kind of dismissed by, I think, a lot of the general public. Mm -hmm. um, one cross reference, though, straight out of Compton, they quote the Beastie Boys. They sampled the Beastie Boys. Yeah, they did. That's right. right. Which is so cool that, like, the ultimate hardcore gangster rap album samples the Jewish Boys from New York. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah it's, it was total props. It was, it's, <laughs> I, I love the history of music. I, I think. Yeah. Now I, I you'll see me proudly wear what I this is a um, some FM. They're a radio station out of uh, San Francisco, south of the market area. I've been oh. listening to it for about thirteen years. I'm really into like down tempo ambient, you know, chill music now. Yeah, <laughs> not because I'm old, but just I mean, I tell people if I had three things to take with me to a deserted island, it'd be my Stearns and Foster king size bed, it'd be my Persol sunglasses, and Groove Salad by Soma FM. And I'm sitting on a deserted island. There you go. That's all you need. That's all I need. I'm cool. Um, but yeah, musical taste. But my, my but those musical tastes of the down tempo ambient, they were very prevalent back in the day too. But you didn't find too much because electronica music, I mean, it was weird. I worked for Warehouse Records when I was 18 years old. I worked for Camelot Records. So I worked in the record stores. And when you saw new music coming out every payday, you're spending, you know, you're buying three new CDs or six mm -hmm. new CDs of what came out for the week. And we knew what was coming out and in the back room. And, you know, um, but the, the electronic and music section, it really wasn't even there. I mean, it was, like you said, rap had its kind of area. Mm -hmm. And then electronica had even a smaller area. 
and rock pop every we were all through the store you know so um, I went to the record store from 89 to 94 and you're absolutely right i mean the import section i think in our store maybe had some more electronica than the yeah. average record store um but yeah you're right you're right there wasn't much going on and then and, and no not for down tempo i mean i think enigma was one of my yeah. biggest ones mm -hmm. that, that yep. sadness that's definitely changed and then deep forest as well i think was a huge one um but you just didn't come across those seeds because they were considered almost like mood relaxation music yeah yeah they were yeah. not com new age, commercial new age, age. that's yeah, what it yeah, was yeah. they put it in the new age <laughs> section it's like this is actually pretty beady and pretty like you could move right. to some of this stuff new age would go from jazz to like kind of you know a pre pre hip-hop kind of you know ambient stuff yeah, yeah absolutely so <laughs> yeah i just uh i guess i've always had a a musical affliction, you know, do, doing stuff. And then, you know, getting in, I have worked on a hip hop uh, television show here in Seattle called the cool out network and was on that show on and off for about eight years with my friend, Giorgio Brown. So he's, he's known me since I was like 18 years old and, and being working close with a, a list celebrity hip hop artists that would come to town and do interviews with them. And kind Dude, of immediately from high school, we're involved in the industry from, from. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah I was right there. And then it was about, eight years of doing that in 2000 i broke away to go do my own show my own um uh broadcast television show because we were on public access and i broke away to to go put my first show and i took it to fox and they well, i took it somewhere else and they rejected it <laughs> but then i took it to fox here locally and they approved it and cool. we aired that in 2002 and the funny thing is the concept for the show i really didn't even know what it was going to be about it was just a, it was a variety show that basically became a show that showed short films by independent producers. And I knew I had one episode in the bag because I had made my first short film in college. There and so go. I'm like, well, there's episode one. Now I got 12 more to come up with. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got the, yeah. the job and you got the first one. Those are the two hardest parts, right? Exactly. And so uh, then I started out of that. We produced a, a nightlife segment and we produced a sports segment. So I broke those two out into their own separate shows. Um, but the nightlife segment, I was, I knew all the people I was partying with in the nightclubs and all the promoters. And it's like, Hey, let's go show that highlight this night, walk in with the camera, talk to the DJs, talk to the people that are there. And that was image nightlife at the time, but then later got rebranded to, um, ITV nightlife. And then later on became ITV live and then became the DJ sessions. Wow. All right. So that was, that was the progression. And this is, you've been doing DJ sessions for 10 years, right? At least. 10 years. Uh, yeah, wow. we're coming up on 11, um, yeah, this will be our 11th year and uh, have some really awesome news. We just actually got um, contacted by Mixcloud, if you're familiar with people yeah, over at Mixcloud. Yeah. And they, uh, they're they bringing us on as one of their featured partners. So we're really excited. Congratulations, uh, brother. That's thank awesome. You. Yeah, we're, we're, we're already we're a Twitch featured partner. And we've been, we're a featured partner with Ustream before IBM bought them out and also with Livestream. But I, I, I was always looking at Mixcloud like, well, that's where you put up your audio files and we're a video show. Right. So once they went to going and doing live streaming uh, on Mixcloud's platform, it's in beta, but it's there. They got the licensing and everything. I kind of, I'm looking at possibly being a convert and, and pushing us over to the, the Mixcloud side of things. But this is, it's a growing, like you said, technology is always growing. It's moving forward and we need to be able to find the right home for us. Yeah. Twitch has been great to us. We love them. Dearly, uh, when we made featured partner with them, they they actually just said get over here, and I was like at that time I think there was like thirty thousand featured partners in the world. Um, I think we still rank in the top point. This very the top point one percent of streams, um, which is just awesome over there. Yeah, um, but again, it's it's video, it's it's everything streaming platform. Whereas Mixcloud is really going to be about the music it's the producer it was built by djs for djs that's how they'll put it in their press release this is how we go so we're really excited to get in front of that audience uh, and, and start the branding process and get everything up and running over there um I, I just we have a brand new website that's coming out too for the dj sessions um so if you're going there right now that's version 2.0 actually right. that version 2.0 took me about a year and nine months to finally get out of beta <laughs> the new website that's going to be le released here soon version 3.0 should be ready to be launched in about a week so if today is february 11th mm -hmm. and it's 5 20 p.m pacific standard time you're on record. about a week from now, <laughs> you're on <laughs> record, week from now. um 
yeah, we're we're super excited for the new site. I, I tell people it's like having we've been driving the Honda Accord and now we got the Ferrari in the garage. I'm just waiting to take it out. And um, yeah, right. just been cool. a, it's a very surrounding myself with music. It's been mm -hmm. a huge part of my life. You know, I think it's it's definitely something that, that people need. They need collective music experiences. Um, sharing those music experiences, not having that for over a year. Uh, we had over 150 events last year scheduled. Mm -hmm. And that's, I know promoter friends of mine, people I've known in the industry for years, and they throw one show a month and it, poof, I'm coming out of the box and we started doing our own events. And I had a hundred events on the schedule with, uh, I don't know if you got a chance to check out our show, the mobile sessions. I haven't, no, I've, I've watched a few of yours, uh, of your shows, of yeah. the TV sessions, but I didn't check them. I saw it, but I didn't watch any of them. So the mobile yeah. sessions, we basically have a big glass box on the back of a truck. Oh, you know what? I think I might've seen the uh, avian guy there. I yes. Think I, yes, right. I, do, I do watch a clip of that. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And one, of, one of our top, wow, gosh, I'm so honored to be working with that guy, avian. He's, he's going to come on my show. I'm, I'm booking him for, uh, for next oh, month. Oh, yeah, right on. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, yeah. Um, awesome. Can't wait to check him out. Yeah, he is fun. He He's just a gem. And uh, I mean, great, great, great guy. And, um, you know, we basically drive this truck around though with, with peep DJs playing. I got to... Mackie, one of our sponsors, actually just gave us 4,000 watts more of sound. They gave us two of their uh, V-Class Series 15-inch uh, PA systems that we added to the truck that already had a 1,600-watt sound. So you could already hear this thing from a good eighth of a mile away. <laughs> now you're hearing it from probably about a quarter mile away. It's oh, yeah. loud. Nice. Um, and we drive it through the Seattle city streets and basically still try to give people a, a music experience where they can see people having fun dance. I mean, they they do their little thing. They pull out their phone, they take mm -hmm. shots and it's they contagious. Really get behind it. I mean, yeah. it's, it's a fun project that we do a uh, fun project, fun show, I should say. But um, we also do what's called silent disco events. Well, so we, back to the other one, you do that uh, every, is it weekly show or is that? Oh uh, yeah. The truck goes around weekly. We're going to be yeah, starting back up here in March. Uh, and uh, we have so some other you're off it's, it's seasonal. Uh, no, it isn't really. It's, it's more, <laughs> it's more that, um, I'll tell you what happened off show because it's a pretty oh, funny story. Okay. But um, the, the the truck is parked right now. Um, oh, is it with a boot? Is it, wearing, is it wearing winter boots? <laughs> it's having it's having some work done to it. Oh, okay, okay. So, um, but we used to put people in this thing like a party bus. I mean, that's mm. basically what it's classified as. Just only you can see through the windows. And I mean, we I had a client of mine years ago, sponsor of ours, Alphabet Vodka. They would rent the truck from us for the Seahawks tailgate parties. Oh, and sweet. we drive around the tailgate parties, giving out free shots of vodka to all the tailgaters. There you go. So it became synonymous as being known as the vodka truck. Where's the free <laughs> vodka? You know, and I mean, and then the off the police officers, they're they're really cool here. I mean, they don't give us a lot of flack. They're just like, mm. move along, guys. We know yeah. you're doing your thing. So um, the town knows about it. It's something good. And we're looking at doing something here. I talked about this 10 years ago. I actually got a little plug on Kevin Smith's smodcast when he had first started it out um he met, talked about uh, the show i was going to do called the freeway sessions the fastest moving dj show in the world and we were going to take the truck and drive from city to city to city like a road tour Neat. and and then meet up with other djs and throw events with those local djs and then pick up the next round and go to the next city and go to the next city and uh we were had a sponsor on board last year that was coming in i mean it was a 12 to 15 city deal oh. one way didn't know if we were going to come back the other way um but it was a pretty big deal and uh, unfortunately all their field marketing went bye bye so never came to fruition no, well, it's it's on hold, totally on hold. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I was on their phone. I was on the phone with the person who does all their marketing here for West Coast. They put me on the phone with the East Coast person. He's like, "Let's pull the trigger on this." Okay, great. We're gonna do this in August. Oh wait, we're gonna do Seattle, Portland in October. Wait, we're pushing this off till twenty twenty one. I'm like, yeah, oh. yeah. yeah. Uh, Everything's been kind of like that. Everything's been kind of like that. Little load uh, of load of mid six figure deal that just went poof. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bummer. Bummer. <laughs> yeah. So, so we, had, um, we had a complaint. We had a complaint about your your dig on Hondas. So I drive a Honda too. Someone said, "Hey, Hondas are sweet rides." <laughs> no, yeah. Hondas are sweet rides. I used, a, I used to have a Honda Accord. I had an EX Honda Accord, <laughs> Eddie Bauer edition. I was don't I drive I'm, not, I'm, not on Hondas. I'm just saying that's what we had. <laughs> it's like we just got upgraded. <laughs> You know, I mean, yeah, I want a Ferrari. I want a Ferrari. Don't you know? I love a Ferrari. You know, uh, you know, just I just it is so slick. I mean, I, yeah, I, I get. Giddy. 
I get excited. I, I get every, I had to create a complete sub conversation for my team and my DJs because I was giving them too many updates in the main combo. I just made, let's make a website only combo today. This today, this today, right, this, right, right. Like, baby. <laughs> you know, um, but it's just sharp. It is awesome. So yeah, we're, we're excited for that coming out. So let's go back to the beginning of the DJ yeah. sessions. Let's talk about when the DJ sessions first started, right? Cause that's kind of the, that's your main, I, I don't know, uh, foundational <laughs> brand, right? Doesn't that seem like it? Funny enough, when the DJ sessions was coming out and we were going full hard with, I'll, I'll dive into the story. I had eight, no, I had 12 other shows that I was working on as well. So the DJ sessions became, so what happened is ITV was going to be broad, the broadcast television line of stuff. Mm -hmm. ITV Live was going to be the live streaming stuff. Okay. Well, the first show ever produced by ITV Live was the DJ sessions. So if you go back and look at our episodes 10 years ago, um, you're hearing me always saying, and it's ITV Live presents the DJ sessions, where finally in 2013, I just dropped the ITV Live, made DJ sessions its own brand. Got it. Now the whole ITV line of shows is kind of going wee, and everything's just been all about the DJ sessions and that brand and that company and Got your franchise. All that stuff. Yeah, it, it was funny. I, so here's how the whole thing came about. I went to Winter Music Conference in 2009. Okay. And I was there. And while I was there, there was this, we were staying in a nice big condo with my friends and everything. There was this kid that I had just met. He says, Hey, Darren, you're a video guy. What do you know about this online live streaming stuff? And I'm like, video streaming it's expensive he goes well there's this there's this website over here called justin tv and i'm like really justin tv i don't know what okay anything about that because i was running internet radio stations out of my apartment mm. i had like I'd, I'd take independent artists and i just you could stream live off my my g5 server out of my apartment and i had like seven or nine different genres of stations because i found out a quick time server could do all that fun stuff. It was really cool. So you do the technology, right? You know, yeah. Yeah. I worked for Apple for a number of years. So oh, cool. kind of kind of got some insights. I stuff worked for IBM for a bunch of years. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, so basically, um, I go to Winter Music Conference. This guy is talking about live stream. And I'm like, dude, there's no way anyone's going to give this away for free. I mean, just to get the server space alone, I was looking at $3,000 a month to mm -hmm. do live streaming, da -da 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 all this, and putting... Bandwidth like, no, and no, yeah, bandwidth, yeah. everything. Well, then yeah. you had to have, yeah, you had to have upload bandwidth. You had a big pipe. You had a big I mean, pipe. Where, where the heck are you going to get that from on your commercial connection at home when you get, oh, two megabit upload speeds? <laughs> right. Really, it means, oh, 400 to 600, yeah. Um, yeah. which is, you know, not anything at all. But um, so I came back from Winter Music Conference and I started playing around with Ustream software because everyone, everything in the world was made for PC. Mm -hmm. You know, how it rolls out. I'm like, did they make a Mac version? Is there a Mac version? Let me see what's on Mac. Cause I'm a Mac guy, Mac guy. And um, basically uh, I started playing with Ustream and I just started doing crazy stuff. I wake up in the morning. I, these videos are still able to be found somewhere. Uh, I'm sure they're either on, on Ustream servers or they're actually probably ingested into our website. Right. But I would wake up at nine o'clock in the morning, make my cup, make my big cup of tea. And I go, guess what? We're going to be dialing for dollars today because I owned an advertising business at the time. Mm -hmm. Or I was, I was say here, or no, I was looking for sponsorship dollars. That's what I was, I was going to start calling sponsors for my broadcast television job. So anyways, I knew all these nightclub promoters, knew all the people in the nightlife scene. And I started bouncing the idea off of some of my friends saying, hey, let's, we could stream live. We could stream DJs live. And I wanted to give the guy enough birth because I didn't, want him to think that I stole his idea mm. of being a live streaming DJ. And then I come and start up this live streaming DJ platform. Right. So like about six, seven months go by. And one day my friend Alex Eagleton calls me up. He worked for a club vibes out here. And he says, Darren, I'm coming over to your house. We're doing the DJ sessions tonight. This is on a Tuesday night. And I went, okay. So here I am at sitting at my desk at my desktop computer. I have a camera over my shoulder looking back this way with Alex behind me uh -huh. and another camera sideways down looking on him. We jump on social media and I start plugging away. We're in headphones the whole time in my apartment. I'm rocking out the first hour is just like, I'm just with the, in the music. This is awesome. And I get up, we were drinking wine. Mm. I remember this cause I went up and got up to go to the bathroom. Uh -huh. And when I got up to go to the bathroom, I pulled my headsets off and it was completely silent in my apartment. And I was like, I just felt like I was in a nightclub for an hour. Right. Wait a second. I put my headsets back on. 
take my headsets off. I'm like, it just transformed it. And then mm. the next week after that was done, I, I moved all, I had a multi camera rig set up and I moved it all into my bedroom, called it the new studio. <laughs> and then all of a sudden started inviting people over to my house to come play and stream them live out of my bedroom studio. And that was going pretty good. I mean, it was, this is probably October ish, 2009, October, 2000. Viewers? Were you getting a lot of viewers when you first started? Um, not, social media was helping us. Um, yeah. We were breaking it out of the box. I mean, I had talked and got connected with Ustream and was, mm. you know, quickly ramped up to a featured partner with the, with the caveats of everything that we were bringing to the, to the table. But what really launched us, what really took us to that next level was, um, Earlier that year at Winter Music Conference, I had hooked up with um, Sarah Cooper from Sarah Cooper PR. And she is the PR person for Dave Dresden. She's the PR person for Carl Cox. Uh, these are some huge names, huge names. And mm -hmm. uh, I actually interviewed Dave Dresden at Winter Music Conference earlier that year. And I was going to have an opportunity to do one with Carl Cox. And for some reason, I never pushed it. And I didn't even think about who he was or at the time I look back and history going, ah, but, what, um, what, I didn't, what are you going to do? You know, I know. So anyways, what happened later that year, Dave Dresden was coming to town to play. And I said, Hey, Sarah, Dave's coming to town. Would it be cool if he came by our studio and played on our show and this and Dave was like, yeah, sure. Wow. So Dave Dresden shows up to play my bedroom, my bedroom. I mean, my, my one bed, one, one bedroom apartment. And I have like 20 of my friends there. Dave's full play, yeah, full full set. Dave's doing his thing, and I took a break. I just looked at it and went, "I'm freaking on to something here." Yeah, I'm on to something here. This is two years before the boiler room even started. So what, what year was what year was, did that happen? How long? Late 2009. It was in the first year of when you were doing it. Yeah, for, first few months. First, like it went wow. October. It was. I want to say he came up here in Decemberish. I think it was. Damn. So it was like a couple. Yeah. So then I just started going okay, now I should be working with the other local promoters. Uh, let me go get another studio. So let me get a location. Yeah. Uh, I got I had to work about getting the internet pumped in there on a you know major business bandwidth connection. I think it was like 150 or 100, 200 bucks a month. And we were getting two meg uploads. And I was always constantly on the phone with this company. So we'd be getting like 700 megs a second or not I mean 700 megabits. No, no, we were, no, I'm sorry. We were, what's two megs, but you get, What's the another step down? The bits? Megabytes? Megabytes. I should know this stuff. We were getting shitty internet. Let's just yeah, say that. Sorry. Yeah, I'm I swear on your show. And, and I mean, but we were doing it. And we had people come by. A-list celebrities were coming by the studio all the time to do interviews with us. We were right around the corner from some of the hot nightclubs downtown. So it was just a hop, skip, and a jump How for them. How are How are you just... Uh, just reaching out, just yeah. just contacting their websites, just doing our job and saying, this is who we are. This is what we'd like to do. Da -da -da -da. Now, a lot of the PR agents, a lot of the people know us. They, right. They're they actually throwing their people to us. Um, unfortunately, you know, with everything being shut down, there's no traveling. And it was funny that I hadn't been doing, I could have been doing Zoom interviews years ago, but I still don't think the industry shift to even take live streaming as a platform. I think you're talking about, we've been doing this for 10 years. Of course, my phone blew up off the hook in March of last year. Cause everyone's like, how do you do it? What kind of yeah. cameras? What do you right. do? What about right. copyright? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, you're really ahead of the game when this hit. Yeah. We're like really far ahead of this. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, you know, and, and how do you get more viewers and all that stuff? And I kind of just learned to stay in my own lane, focus on my show, congratulate everyone that has taken on this medium. Uh, and, and, and does it and keeps going with it. It's, it can be grueling. And then when, when an industry, the, you look at the music industry as a whole, I say this quite often in interviews with people is that, you know, if, if there were 10 million DJs, producers, musicians, let's say just 10 million electronic people, mm. I'd say about a hundred thousand of them were regularly streaming live. Like they had a show, they were doing this because they got, they got tours, they got nightclubs, they got gigs. It's like, they don't want to put on a show. They already did shows, mm. but once, <laughs> once stuff closed down, all 10 million of them jumped online. Right. I mean, it's, I think Twitch's growth doubled, um, in, in, in streamers and consumership or viewership, uh, podcasting grew exponentially. I think last I heard it grew by almost another million, there were a million podcasters pre 2020. And then now there's like 2 million podcasters and there's more coming out 
yeah. every day. Yeah. Um, and there might even be more than that, but that's just a significant growth. And now it's going to be some, when I was having a conversation with people a year ago going, Oh yeah, we're a featured partner on Twitch. They'd be like, what's, what's Twitch or isn't that the place where people do video games and stream video games live? Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, but there's other stuff you can do there too. <laughs> well, it's funny. Yeah. I, I'm an IT 20 year IT professional. And before yeah. last year I had never used zoom and um, I had never been on Twitch. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'd used all their social media platforms. I, I used, you know, Microsoft Teams for all of my video conferencing, very comfortable with video conferencing, but it wasn't until the shutdown and my yoga school was like, we're on Zoom. I was like, what the hell is Zoom? <laughs> I downloaded it and immediately I used it to connect my family, right? Because we, at the hour north of New York, we were the, one of the first cities to get hit, right? So didn't mm -hmm. know what was going on. And yeah, man, so since April 8th, I've done 160 shows. Um, right on. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, it's in nine months I did. I took a two week break, ended my season one. Um, and, and it's funny you say, yeah, you turned your bedroom into the studio. I had like five studios all in this house. It was like the family room. I was in the basement. I was, yeah. <laughs> so I've been doing it. Uh, but it's funny because, um, yeah, I'm, I'm nine years late. <laughs> well, uh, no, I'm, I right on time. I'm right on time. For Everyone's me. jump. It, it doesn't matter if people are jumping on now. If they want to get on the camera and talk, it is I, the time I, to do it now. Connecting. It's about connecting and yeah. sharing fun experiences and, and trying to, you know, light yourself up, light other people up and try to have some fun in this stuck situation right absolutely you know and, and if you wouldn't have told me i, I would have thought that that was a, a studio i would not have known that was another room in your house at all well, and this is my son's room who we did he just moved out with his girlfriend so i was able to finally have an office and you know i've been waiting for over 40 years for this <laughs> nice yeah it's uh it's it's just amazing but what how little it takes to get into the game now um sure. you know the one thing i tell people all the time is just stick with it just keep going i mean at one point we are getting ready to starting probably when the new site goes up. I actually have to go negotiate one of the deals tonight. We're going to get back to our schedule of every Sunday, every Tuesday, every Wednesday, and every uh, Saturday we have shows, four hours minimum of content. We're at 16 hours of content every week coming in. And um, sorry, I just had one of my DJ, one of my DJs is texting me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you know, 16 hours of content a week to me, that was, n that was never hard. That was not a hard thing for me to do. Oh, granted, I'm not necessarily doing tons of floor directing or tons of script writing or right. all that, stuff, but you still have to show up to the game, play the game, get the footage, bring the footage back, mm -hmm. um, edit the footage usually and, and put that up. And that's, you know, not even that's kind of a small amount because with our silent disco events, if you're familiar with that technology, I'll tell you about it in a little bit, but basically I can, I can have four different tapings going on at the same location. So I can get up to 16 hours of content in just one four hour city. Oh, that's sweet. Yeah. That's and sweet. doing that every Friday or doing that every Saturday, doing that every Sunday. Okay. <laughs> that's 32 hours of content. We have four hours of our hit show that we're, we always hit in like the top 10 on Twitch mm -hmm. and we're going live from Waterland Arcade for Attack the Block on Tuesdays. And the truck, there's another four hours right there. So you got 40 hours of content a week from an independent level. And we have no, we have affiliate sponsorships. We were just getting ready to go out and start getting full fledged paid sponsors last year. Right. Um, so this has all been out of, my blood, sweat, and tears, and you know, not making any money back at it. I mean, yeah, we might yeah. come off like we're we're a half million dollar, ten million dollar operation. <laughs> we got Ferraris in the garage that are our websites, but <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Eventually, they'll yeah. come to fruition and turn into four wheels and a uh, steering wheel. Hopefully, exactly. So you know, you just got to keep <laughs> kind of keep going through with it and doing it. And I've I've literally learned to pace my pace myself because there are times when I burnt myself out. I didn't want to pick up a camera. Didn't Hello, touch I think I learned that lesson. Year one, 100. Yeah. Don't do 160 shows by yourself. It's fucking nuts. I mean, that is crazy. That's a cr crazy. crazy. I think I went a little crazy. I went a little crazy. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, it, it doesn't. And that's why I said to somebody the other day, they were telling me, they were using uh, Giorgio, good friend of mine. He says, I got, he just got a brand new studio, all brand new black magic gear, tons of stuff. They work with Washington Hall. Super excited for him. And he's like, Darren, this April, things are coming back. It's going to be big. And I said, Giorgio, what does big mean? Because mm. what big means to you may not mean big to me, you know? Right. So let's be on this, it, it, whatever's big to somebody. If somebody even made one podcast and they got to that level, that's big. Mm. That's, that's mm. huge, yeah. you know? And then you're going to go through all the different things, whether it's a microphone, your lighting, 
you know, your, your presentation questions, what you're going to say, what not to say, mm -hmm. you know, feedback. I come from a world of broadcast television. We had focus groups. Yeah. People, and you go to some people they are like, what the hell is a focus group? It's where a bunch of people basically look at your shit and tell you if it sucks or not. Yeah. Basically, tell you what, what, what sucks, what to change, right? Yeah. 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 What to change. And, and so I take that knowledge with me of the broadcast world into this world. Yeah. Um, but some people they just got to go through it. I think uh, Gary V. I love watching him. Uh, it was a video I saw him years ago. He was talking about his wine podcast or his wine show, and as he was talking to the camera to the to the audience, mm. he had a, a it was a little um, picture and picture of all of his past episodes count and it was counting up. So it was like one two three four five six seven eight, nine, 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 and was going up and up and and you could see. Even you go back and you look at like Joe Rogan stuff. I don't watch his show, but mm. he goes, "We our our show looked like shit when we first started. Yeah. Now yeah. we got a production budget. <laughs> now it's awesome, you know. And so, you know, you just got to keep going at it, and and, and you, everyone can go out at their own pace, you know. I you know I, I don't think it's fair to compare one person's efforts to another unless you're saying, okay, well. What's your reach or what's your dollar amount you take? I mean, there's so many other factors. So, but if you're having fun at it, do 160. Nah, oh, yeah. it was good. I was having fun, but I'm, I'm going twice a week. I'm going to do Thursday, Saturdays, 8 p.m., right? Go for an hour, two hours, and then, uh, you know, we'll see. I've got like 14 guests booked, right? So uh, this Saturday, I'll give a plug for my show. i got Merle Saunders Jr., right? So his dad was Merle Saunders who played with Jerry Garcia, but Merle Saunders Jr. was the guitar tech for Frank Zappa on his last tour. He was a stage wow. tech on Michael Jackson's bad tour. Right? I have a picture of him on stage with MJ. Um, like, so yeah, Miles Davis used to stop by his house when he was a kid. Like, like, so you can have some fun talks on Saturday with Merle Saunders. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and it, it is, as you go, I think a lot of people, they, the thing that I li like the most is when you work with these celebrity artists or these people, they're, I've never come across a prima donna. I've never come across anyone being rude. I, they've totally genuine, nice, awesome, pleasant people. Mm -hmm. um, I just had I just had Lindsay Sterling on. I don't know if you know who she is or not. Yeah, that was, I, yeah I had Mark to talk about that with Mako, right? That was oh, yeah, that was great. I watched that one. Yes. Oh, yeah. Thank you. yeah, I was. Yeah. I, and so I wait, thirty wait. minutes a day. <laughs> oh, yeah. What you didn't see? What you didn't see is right after that interview ended. I was. What I'd done is I'd asked the question. I kind of broke character a little bit. I, I asked the question that I threw in at the last minute. And when I was going on my outro, I said, oh, wait, I got to ask this last question. Well, what I did is I said, oh, and um, okay, so now you're, you just heard from Lindsey Sterling and Macau. And I didn't catch it. And I even had it fanatically spelt out in front of me with my, my cue sheet and everything. And she goes, Lindsay goes, hey, hey, Darren, I just got one thing for you. And I'm like, oh, shit, what is something? Did I do something wrong? She goes, you pronounced his name wrong at the end of the interview. And I went, I can go fix that in post. <laughs> it's an hour trying to find. <laughs> um, so I could, like, from where I said his name, Mako, yeah. somewhere, pull in and then go edit it and throw it in. I just blame it on Zoom. Yeah, shit happens. What are you going to do? Yeah. I mean, it was funny. I mean, but that's that, that you can't beat yourself up over stuff like that. And I think that's where people can get really critical on themselves. They can also, because they aren't getting the instant gratification that they think they should be getting or mm. should be fine. Like I keep putting all these up and nobody ever listens. Well, have you done any marketing? Mm. Well, I keep posting on my social medias, but you know, Facebook only shows your posts to 5% of your friends. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, have you gotten any write-ups? Have you done any press articles? Have you networked to talk to other people on their podcasts? Yep. Maybe I've yep. hired anyone like Kevin that helps me and from New York to book yep. me on shows. Yeah, yeah, Kevin's great. He's a great kid. I love working with him. I, I, I wish I could get offices and fly him out here and have him work more for me. Um, but um, you just got to put in the time and the investment of, of where you know you see fit. That's and, and what, what you're going to feel good about at the end of the day. I think that's what it really comes down to. Yeah, it does. And I was, you know, thinking about my season one. I mean, having Chris France from the Talking Heads and having, you know, Liberty DeVito from Billy Joel tell me stories about Paul McCartney that, he, you know, Liberty told me a story. He's like, oh, that wasn't in my book, but I'm going to tell you this story about Paul McCartney. I'm like, thank you very much. You know, like, this is great. And that's what it's about is trying to, you know, also make it unique for them. 
for my guests, mm-hmm. right? I want to, I want to be a little different, a little, you know, different flavor of anybody you've ever talked to. I think I can usually accomplish that. Yeah. It's, 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 I've had this a few times in the past where when I start doing my interviews with somebody and I'll, I'll, I'll be in the back room, green room, meeting them in person, I'm like, okay, Hey, it, you know, this is what the show is going to be like. And just, you know, I'm going to ask you these questions. I'm just trying to be nice and not get like all starstruck and all. And then I go, okay, we're recording in five. Four, three. Welcome back to the DJ sessions where we feature the best DJs from around the world. I'm your host, Darren. And right now we're sitting here and they go, What just happened? This one just, what? They, they go, You see them, they go, Oh my yeah. God, this is a pro. <laughs> like, overnight. <laughs> and it's so funny to see him jump up. But I've had a lot of these top level celebrities just like, That was a phenomenal interview because I would only get backstage with them five to seven minutes tops. Right now on a Zoom, I can get a full hour with them. I got to go do my research and I can get into some really in-depth questions with them and chat and I keep it about an hour. Um, and it's just been really free flowing and really going smooth. Yeah. Um, now that I've, I've just said, you know what? We're still going after the top 10,000 DJs in the world. I want every single one of them on my show. You so we, Kevin, Kevin, Kevin is my guy. He sends out all those emails for me <laughs> and puts requests out. And uh, we have a goal set up, but um, you know, now we're just going to keep pushing that button over and over. Whereas before, I would wait for an artist to come to town because mm. they were here on the ground. I could get them here, get them in the studio. But we'll get the pre-interview with them, then let them get to town and do an in-person interview with them, yeah. and then yeah. keep that relationship going as we follow them through their career. Um, I think that's just kind of key. We want to definitely be. The pulse. I've always said that I want to be the first DJ show on Mars. There you go. I can talk to yeah. Elon. Talk to Elon, right? Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> <laughs> he can help me out. Oh, so did you watch the Super Bowl last week? I did. I did. Uh, I got, I, I, I mean, up until, well, I mean, yeah, I think we watched the whole thing. I was with a friend of mine. She didn't know it was Super Bowl Sunday. So I went to the store. I'm a bit of a foodie. Yeah. And uh, we were supposed to hang out and go to brunch that day. And I realized, like the, one of our other affiliate sponsors, Queen Anne Beer Hall, where we're going to be doing what our new shows out of. Uh, I called him up and said, "Hey, you got anything going on for the game?" Because I know one of the owners. He, he worked with us at another establishment. Very well connected. Very awesome guy, Gary. And I said, "Hey, um, are you doing anything at the hall today for Super Bowl?" And he's like, "Dude, we've been sold out for weeks because the restaurants just got open to twenty five percent here." Right. And so um, I was like, "Oh yeah, dude. Okay, so." Uh, my friend wasn't getting back to me. So I go to, we have an H Mart right down the street from my house, two blocks from my house. I was All like, right. I'm going to do something different for my smorgasbord of food today. I went and just grabbed a bunch of crazy shit. And um, and so she got a hold of me and said, I said, oh, look, I'm coming up to your house. We're going to eat. She's like, okay, cool. Not only do I want to get to her house, she sends me back to the store for two more Dungeness crab, snow crab legs. Uh, nice. Yeah. To make pho. I mean, it, we had all this huge spread. I mean, it was, I think we had a, a tart, like a big tart pie at a cherry cake thing. I mean, it was for two people. It was insane. So we were kicking back watching the Super Bowl. I, I kind of liked the halftime show. I know everyone was going off on the weekend and I don't know. I mean, being an editor, knowing what to look for in certain things. I think when he went back into that glass box mirror thing, yeah. I think there was a cut point there and he was not doing that live. I think that was pre pre recorded. Yeah. Uh, that's just how I felt. I, but that has nothing to do with the whole performance. I love the songs. Uh, I thought the first half was better than the second half. Yeah. Um, you know, but uh, yeah, th- th- you're, you're at the caliber of Prince and, and, you know, just, just, just things that you think about that are like, well, it's not that it's not, you know, even like Tom Petty or Paul McCartney or, you know, so I don't know. I, I think it was a little underproduced a little under, like it was, uh, well, there was no gaps, right? There was no every every Super Bowl, at least in the past years, they've kind of brought the brought it up by you know putting Lenny Kravitz on stage with Katy Perry, right? Mm-hmm. Or, or you know, kind of bringing other people out and together. Like DMC and Aerosmith, I think they came out a couple like five seven years ago or something, <laughs> right? So it was it was it was tough for him to not have that, right? So all these super high level people had other tons of people on stage with them, and he had to do it all by himself. So it was tough, you know. Yeah. COVID restrictions, I'm sure, probably played a part in that. Absolutely. Lady Gaga, remember her diving off the top of the, the that video for her? Like that was that was a lot better, right? Yeah. So yeah. but it was fun. Yeah, I mean, I, I wasn't necessarily a fan of either team. I'm a I'm a Russell Wilson. Yeah. I'm a right, Seahawks. Right. Sure. I mean, I, I'm not a huge football fan. Yes, yeah, um, but I, I will say I love watching Russ run. Yeah. You know, yeah. I just he is just I just whenever his feet just start going, I'm like, yeah, go Russ, <laughs> you know. Um, but I could 
I'd probably not watch it. I wouldn't watch football in a normal. No, same here. And I, we had a very similar experience to you. My, my wife got very excited. I think she was more excited for this than Christmas, right? For the food, right? We had wings and we had to, all the, you know, and, and t uh, queso and just things that, you know, we shouldn't be eating. And it was fun. Um, it was fun. And, you know, we've, it, commercial, some of the commercials were good. I like the Wayne's World commercial. Yeah, right? I thought that was funny. That was a good one. Um, I actually, you know what's funny? Talking about food. I had sa salted duck eggs for the first time. Oh, I've never had them before. Yeah, so. yeah. So, I was, like I said, I'll go to the market and I'll just like, grab this. I've never had this before. Let's check this out. And you can get them either soft-boiled or hard-boiled. Um, they don't slice very nicely, though. <laughs> so How big are um, they? Uh, about, yeah, about yay big. I can get one out of okay. the fridge. Um, but they were really salty. Hmm. <laughs> very salty, but very delicious. Um, Trying something new. Yeah, we had some... Uh, some types of fish that I got. I don't know. I, I had some salted fish. Um, I just went yeah crazy on it. But I, I'm more about the food and the social and hanging out. And did you have any uh, any pools? Any did you buy any squares? No, no I don't. No. One cool story. So we had a couple. We had a few. I think we had like five or six of them. And uh, we thought we had lost everything. And my wife was driving to work uh, Monday, and she got sent a hundred bucks. She had won because they do all kinds of crazy reverse things. Like you have the certain numbers, but then you know you go up two and up two, and they win too. Right, so oh, wow. you wouldn't. So we looked at our numbers, didn't think we won. She got to work today. She had a hundred bucks sent to her. So it's like, yeah. Hey. So we had a good Super Bowl nice. Sunday in the Muldoon household. Yeah, they. Um, uh, I, I kind of have a rule that I don't bet on anything that can be influenced by pain. <laughs> yeah, a square is kind of different. Right? A Super Bowl square is it's it's so random. You don't get to really choose anything. So it's it's you know you give a couple bucks and you root for numbers. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's. Um, no, I'll, I'll play. I'll play craps. I'll play blackjack. I'll play. Oh, there you go. There you go. I'll gamble over there, but anything like it's just like you never know. Like what could happen. So, um, I am getting a. Oh, I am hearing that audio. There we go. Did you hear that audio? Did you hear that phone ringing in? I didn't. Okay, it was coming through my. My the new Mac phones they tie into your computer, so when your phone rings, you get a notice on your computer too ah. so here i'm doing the interview with you and i'm like how am i hearing the audio of my phone ringing oh because she's calling me on facebook and i got facebook up right now that's why there you go there you go ah, do it. Ah, do it. so uh what do you think about the rock and roll hall of fame uh nominees have you seen it no i have not seen oh, that there you go. Let's, uh, let's, take, let's take a look here let's yeah take a look. Take a look. yeah definitely let me see here we go can you see that I can. Okay. Oh, Mary J. Okay. Funny story about Mary J. The Go Go's, Devo, mm -hmm. Jay Z, Shaka Khan, Iron Maiden, Ella, okay. <laughs> Iron Maiden, <laughs> Rage Against Rage. the Machine. I like that. Benatar's missing. Pat Benatar so, should be on there. But so now, are they choosing one from all of these, or no? This... I think uh, uh, five. Is it five that make it? I think five make it. Funny enough, going back talking about. Giorgio Brown and the Cool Out Network, uh, he actually filmed and interviewed Mary J for one of his first episodes he ever did up here in Seattle, right when Real Love had come out. Oh, that's pretty cool. And uh, yeah, she was playing at this bar, actually the bar I used to hang out at a lot. Um, and uh, yeah, she was on this little stage, she was singing Real Love. I mean, she was not Mary, I mean, she was Mary J, but not yeah. <laughs> Mary right, J. Right, right, right. And um, that'd be interesting, but Shaka Khan. I mean, I grew up listening to that in the eighties. She's awesome. Five. You five. Who can? Who would you pick? Who are oh, you five? if I could pick. Five. Oh, okay. Five. It's no. hard when you pick it to five. Hmm. I definitely Tina Turner would go in. That's that's a given. Uh, cool J. I'll give. I'll give Cool J. Um, that Devo. Yeah. Uh, Jay Z. Some of these cats. They've been around a lot longer, but he. Could deserve to go in there too, and let's see. Um, uh, uh, the Go Go's, yeah, they were pretty big. I liked the Go Go's as a kid, you know, growing up with the We Got the Beat. Great, great band. So I, had, I hadn't even thought about it until right now, but I'll give my pick. My pick is going to be Devo, Iron Maiden, New York Dolls, Rage Against the Machine, and Tina Turner. Yeah, Tina, I, it's, it's a joke. She's not in there, right? That, yeah, that, that just blows uh, me away there, too. And that's funny. I was just watching Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome two days ago. <laughs> oh, great. That's a oh, great, great movie. Great movie. Oh, I have a funny story. Rage Against the Machine. I saw them open for Cypress Hill 
and I, I had no idea who they were. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so we go to the show and uh, we're um, oh, get rid of this guy. Uh, we go to the show and it was it was Funk Dubious. Do you remember Funk Dubious? Do you remember Funk, Funk Dubious? Dubious? Maybe somebody else, and then Rage, and then Cypress Hill. So me and my buddies all go freshman in college, high as kites, uh, and we're we thinking it's a Cypress show. It was, so it's Funk Dubious and Cypress. What could be in between? But mm -hmm. but just you know stoner rap, right? So we go there. We're like second row. Lights go down for Rage Against the Machine. We're like, oh, what are these guys going to be like? Like, big doobie. And then they come on, and it's like big mosh pit. And, like, people get burned with the joints. And, like, we're just like, oh, my God. Like, so it's quick adjustment. And then we saw Rage Against the Machine, and you know, with, like, 2,000 people, which they'd be filling stadiums <laughs> five years later. Yeah. Um, so I give them props. Actually, I had tickets to see them this past August. Uh, we were supposed to see them at MSG. Yeah, um, I definitely uh, – I think Rage would, would be up there. I remember having their, their CD back in the day. Yeah, you know, and that game changer. Very, that was uh, very awesome. Yeah, that I mean, that was like that kind of Tabarello had that hip hoppy kind of approach to guitar, kind of with some of his sounds. Like there was just something oh, so unique about that man. He's a monster. He's one of my favorites too, Tabarello for sure, for sure. <coughs> oh man. So oh, another thing that happened this week: big day in history, February 9th, nineteen sixty four. That was Beatles played at Sullivan Theater for the first time. Really? Past Wednesday. What song would they have? Uh, would there, was that the Love Me Do performance? They, had, they played five songs. They did play five songs. It's funny. It's oh. funny. Because, yeah, All My Love, uh, Love Me Do, I want uh, I saw her standing there. I want to hold your hand. I'm missing one. All My Love. It, it was five of them. But, yeah, yeah, that was this past Wednesday, 1964. Uh, yeah. Was, out, of, out, of all, out of all the rockers I talked to in my season one, that event um, – you know, Liberty DeVito from Billy Joel's band, uh, Prescott Nile from The Knack, everybody that was Chris France from from uh, Talking Heads, uh, everybody resonated with that. And it's funny to hear from them because my mom tells me stories of when she was sitting around the TV and watching that. And yeah, Beatles are still rocking everyone's world, I think. Like you mentioned, even the Beastie Boys, right? There was Beatles, uh, Beatles and the Beasties. It's funny you mentioned that particular, um, that experience being on the Ed Sullivan Show, Ed Sullivan Theater. Um, and being televised that I was talking with somebody recently about MTV and the first video ever played on MTV, which was video killed the radio star. Yep. And, um, you know, but you think back it, that that yeah. was supposed to like, we probably took it in the eighties that music video killed the radio star, but it really was video TV back in the day that right. they, you had to now step it up. You couldn't be, you had a fit, you had an image with the, the, the music now. Um, you know, you couldn't be just a microphone in a studio anymore. So, um, just interesting how, you know, how pro, how big music and television coming together, you know, are, uh, in that sense. And where I'm trying to get with this though, is it brings me into something I've it's been on the topic of many people's conversations lately, synchronization of music in the industry when it comes to copyright. Hmm. Um, a lot of people don't know that once you sync music with video, it, you have to get a sync license for that. Um, so yeah. just, I, I don't know where that came. I was kind of left field. I know we were going, <laughs> but, but um, <laughs> you know, I, I learned about a lot of this stuff back in broadcast television world, you know, that, yo, you gotta get sync use. You gotta get personal releases. You gotta get like contract after contract after contract. And, um, you know, but yeah, it's people, I, I can't remember what my first, I think queen, my dad was a huge Queen fan. I think seeing Freddie Mercury and the ba and the boys and on the stay on TV was huge for yeah. us. Like, you know, but yeah, a little little Beatles a little bit before. Me. I mean, they were relevant, but I was born in '74, so yeah, '75. I, I got to the Beatles kind of later, like college. I think college level. Mm -hmm. I ended up getting in. I was more Stones, I think, and, and more you know Ramones and ACDC before that. Mm -hmm. But funny, actually, the first video was uh, you know Video Killed the Radio Star. Do you know what the second video was? No, who who can't? No, it's oh, it was Pat Benatar. I had Roger Caps on. I had Pat Benatar's bass player on. And he was like, Yes, everyone says, you know, everyone knows that. But he's like, Our video was the second one. I forgot what song it was, but it was a Pat Benatar song. That was the second video ever on MTV. I'm even trying to think. I mean, I, well, she had a few albums back then. So, oh, yeah. Oh, it wasn't Heartbreaker. It was something uh, it was before that. But so I was uh, thinking, yeah. Wait, it wasn't Love is a Battlefield, was it? No, that was later. That, that, was, that, was, that was later. later. Yeah. yeah, that was later. One song Roger said he doesn't like to play. He never liked to play. <laughs> he thought they sold out when they did that one. Oh, man. Oh, we lost another great today. Uh, Chick Corea. 
Chick Corea passed, the jazz piano player, played with Miles Davis. Uh, he was in Return to Forever. I was just actually listening to this. Here's a, a Chick Corea with uh, Lionel Hampton. Oh, Hampton. So Chick passed. So uh, rest in peace, Chick Corea. I've been seeing tons of posts. All my friends kind of mourning him. Um, you know, he was he was a game changer for, for jazz fusion. Um, so, you know, I know a lot of people are playing their, their Chick Corea albums right now. And he, he did a lot uh, – very prolific, hundreds, of, probably a couple hundred albums, um, and prolific up to the end. Uh, he had just done a course, uh, a training course, um, you know, for for musicians um, that he was offering. So it's 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 good that he stayed active to the end. But uh, you know, rest in peace and thanks for all the great vibes and music from uh, Chick Corea. I'll be playing some Miles Davis later, thinking about him. For sure. Crazy you bring that up. I just was going through one of my music, not rants, one of my music frenzies of posting music. Uh, I was on, on a little bit of a Daft Punk kick for some reason, yeah. but. Um, I came across Take Five by the Dave Brubeck Quartet, and I put when I put that up. I'm like, this is this is it, right? This is this is. I mean, there's all, all tons, but I just always love that one, you know. Um, one of the I wonder if it was one of the first dates or within the first couple year or two of when I met my wife. Before she was my wife, I took her to see Dave Brubeck at the wow. at, at Perkins College at, at the college that she had gone to. We went and saw Dave Brubeck, so it was. Uh, very thankful I got to experience his music. Wow. Life. Yeah, that would yeah. be awesome. Yeah. I mean, this, uh, I, I think there's uh, my, my next door neighbor, his dad played the saxophone and we have our, our, our 88.5 FM radio out here is our jazz station. And we kind of would make fun of him because he bust out this sax and he'd start playing the sax along and he, but he just loved it so much. And now I look back in life and I'm like, he knew what he was into. He knew he was into jazz. He knew what he was doing. You know, yeah. he wasn't by any means some big, big musician or anything. Just a guy. He was a carpenter by trade and and um, owned his own carpet business, uh, carpenter business. But he bust out his sax and just started, you know, and it's like, what, what you think you're, it's funny as a kid? You look back later in life and go, I ah, was an adult. That's pretty damn cool, you know. Yeah, so, yeah. Because the range of things that are cool gets bigger as you get older, right? Yeah. <laughs> as, long, as long as you get pissed off by the younger stuff coming up, and that's something I don't. I mean, um, I'm, I love new music, and, and um, I have some great new artists coming on that I'm, that I'm, uh, I'm booking into my second season, which is great. I definitely want to support as many folks as I can out there, right, in these, this, this day and age, um, including uh, – tell me more about uh, Avion. Well, how'd you, how did you meet? And, um, yeah, you know, I think – how did we exactly connect? Okay, so it would have been – Last, Avian Invasion, right? Yeah, Avian Invasion. And um, he moved up here, and he went to go try to knock on the door of one of our larger event production companies um, who are now out of business. Um, but they had all the contracts with Insomniac and big name events to do big, big shows. And he went to knock on the door. I was like, hey, I'm this guy. I have this, this genre persona. I'm a producer. I'm music. I can get on stage. I'm talented to all this stuff. And they whispers wouldn't even return his calls didn't even reach out to him and um i think how did he see us i'd have to go back and look he may have saw, seen the truck driving gosh matt please if you're watching this don't don't get on me <laughs> <laughs> i should have a story of knowing how i met everyone he may have just reached out through our request to play form on the show seeing the truck driving around and i think he said i want to get in the back that's what it was i want to get in the back of that truck and i want to play to that truck and so he reached out to me and I said, just fill out the request to play form. And then um, pretty much that's my default. You have now been recruited by the yeah. DJ sessions to now I'm going to hit you up with being a resident DJ. Hey, I'm on the I'm the yeah. bus. <laughs> and uh, I mean, it, it's, it, I call it my, my kind of farming ground, but, but you know, um, we do get a lot of requests from DJs that want to come play on the show. So I just have to make sure we have everything. I'm a very contractual person, like put everything out in paper, uh, cross the I's, dot the T's, all that fun stuff. Um, but, uh, you know, he just came on the show and I saw him. I mean, he is not every one of our DJs, top notch, awesome. All could there, all could hold their weight down, you know, hold hold down the fort if they were mm. to do, do big, big shows and stuff like that. Um, but his sets, when he goes live on Twitch, I would literally jump out of bed and run to my computer and turn them on and jump in the chat room and be like, I'm here, everyone. You know, <laughs> um, because he's just so animated. He's just, he gets everything that you need to do to be an online streamer without it being annoying. Hmm. And I'm not trying to critique it. Say everyone, I guess annoying could be a bad term to say some people are, but 
he has in-show participation. His viewers are engaging. He's engaging. It doesn't ruin the flow of a show because he's mixing a DJ set on tracks that he's produced, but then he'll, did you get a chance to check out any of his shows yet? A minute, like a, a couple minutes. Okay. I didn't, I didn't so do anything, you know, substantial. He'll grab, he'll grab a keytar and he'll start playing live on the keytar right on top of the mix. He has his dabs. Like you can, you could spend uh, seeds of awesomeness and get him to do different things like color blasts. And I mean, it's just, it's a fun show, a fun product. It's what live streaming should be. I tell all my DJs, go, go watch him. Go yeah. watch him if you want to be animated. Cause back in the day, I had brought DJs in the studio. They weren't used to being in front of a camera. So you'd see these episodes where I'm bouncing, dancing up and down for yeah. four hours because the DJ is just like this. Right. Yeah, you got to have some kind of animated. Yeah. So I was this animated person, but he just gets to just love love his energy uh, when he gets, gets, on, gets behind the camera. So uh, the other day we were driving around in the mobile studio and he's a part of what's called the, the furry community. I hope I'm... Um, saying that right, mm -hmm. but it's the people they party and they dress up in the big furry costumes and yep. they rent a boat every year, the high U boat, and they rent out um, nightclubs and they have their whole crews show up in these outfits. Well, we took one of his friends and had him in the bird outfit and he was driving around the back of the truck dancing with avian playing and the bird that's, dancing. That's what I watched the clip of that's yeah. with, the bird, with the bird in the truck with them, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's just kind of really, um. It's amazing. It just because I'm in the front of the truck driving this truck and I have tinted windows. So uh -huh. people don't know that I'm watching. I look at everyone's facial reactions and they never look at me and the, who's driving the truck. They look at what's in the back of the truck. Of course. of course. You know, I have two marine grade speakers that shoot music forward and then out the back of the truck. It's I have to give everyone earplugs to ride in the back of the truck. They, you you cool. will lose your hearing in 30 minutes being back there. Yeah. Yeah. And um he just rocks it. We took him out. We did uh, also did a uh, New Year's Eve. We drove around Seattle this year. Um, this year, yeah, took yeah. it out with him and uh, DJ Dangerous, one of our other newer DJs, a really awesome guy, as well. And uh, put them both in the back and uh, drove around Seattle because there was nothing going on. Everyone got near the Space Needle, and uh, they thought something was going to happen at the Space Needle, which no, wow. that was not going to happen. But we ended up pulling the truck right up to the Space Needle. And we were like the stage. We were, we were the music for New Year's Eve, That's and there cool. was, there was probably a good thousand, fifteen hundred people there, wow. maybe yeah. more. Um, that they thought something was going to happen at the Space Needle. Like y'all didn't get the memo. There's nothing happening. Like <laughs> no, it was, it was supposed to be a virtual thing mm. that you were supposed to be able to watch from your. I think you could watch it from your phone or you're supposed to watch it from home. They did like a virtual fireworks show. Okay. Um, okay. This, this is the celebration for the space needle, but there was nothing in person. Right. Um, right. You brought the but, fun, but we brought the fun. We usually <laughs> do that. I mean, I go out to places now and you know, I'll be sitting with somebody and I'll say, Hey, have you ever seen the glass box truck with the DJs in the back? And they go, uh huh. You know, that's us. <laughs> and they go, Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So did you hear the uh, announcement of New York for entertainment? So as of, I think it's the end of February, it's, it's kind of ridiculous, but uh, stadiums or venues that hold over 10,000 people can have events with 10%. <laughs> so, right. So, so Madison Square Garden, right there in Madison Square Garden holds like what? 25,000 people, 2,500 can go. <laughs> 10,000 close, you know, 1,000 people. See that's just and then we've and they've already like, and you have to be tested within three days and prove it to get in. What do you prove? What do you show? You have to show a test. You have to show a negative uh, COVID test. You mean something on a piece of paper that comes yeah. off a printer from my house? Uh, well, I don't know what the. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How I mean, are they gonna know what's an know. official letter? Or right, not? right, right, right. <laughs> I can see. I just print something off of my printer and here. Yeah, I got it. I mean. They but, can't verify it. HIPAA doesn't give them the authority I, to check to check each one of those things. Take your take your MSG. Look, yeah. I'm all for safety. I get it, but some of this stuff I look at and I'm like, how how would they even logistically pull that off? Well, I'm wondering like, how the numbers would make it tenable. How do you have? Yeah, a, I, I mean, there you, there you go. People, unless well, you charge them a thousand dollars a ticket, and you charge fifty dollars a beer. Yep. Yeah, well, and that's ten, and ten bucks to pee. That's. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's what the nightclub owners were saying here when they opened it up because they can do 25% capacity, up to 200 people. Right. But they're like, and then even the rules are in the, the bars, they have to be able to put 
a 20 foot barrier between the performer and the, the people. And then each of the people at the establishment have to socially distance six feet away from right. the other people. There's not right. enough room in there. You might, I think the guy says with all of this put into play, we looked at it, we'd have 55 people that could come into our bar right. for a show that we normally would have about, you know, 400 people being packed in here. Mm -hmm. We can't make money doing that. That does yeah. not a reality. And I told people, you know, you're probably going to see schools come back before you see live entertainment come back. We do events. We're actually considered an essential business. Mm -hmm. um, most people don't understand how we are considered an essential business, but don't need to go down that whole route. But we are. It's not a fudge of the system. It's not a loophole. It's because media-based companies and artists and businesses that live stream are considered essential businesses. And with our silent disco technology, we can go out to the parks. We don't need any permitting for what we do whatsoever. And our headsets, when somebody gets a headset from us, we slide it six feet across the table to them. I don't even come within contact with them. It's in a sealed bag. It's already been sanitized. The headsets do not get reused. When they come back into me, I re-sanitize them all over again. They don't get used for another 24 to 48 hours if, if they were to be used. So that san sanitizer sits on it. The point is, is that we actually helped write the playbook on doing safe events. So you've been doing silent discos throughout? We were doing silent discos up until about November-ish last year. Good. I took a little bit of a break over the holidays, um, just a little bit of colder weather. Uh, we used to be able to put a big, do a big bonfire at the park that we go to, but now we can't really do that. Um, and so um, not having portable heater systems. Not, it can be yeah. we, we hashtag bundle up and boogie was our, kind of our thing. Um, we're going to wait for to warm up a little bit, but we were literally right in the public. And yeah, people came out of the woodworks at me. They wanted to point fingers at me. Hey, you can't throw an event. So I'm like, why don't you come out and see what our operation is? You just can't even do that at all. I go, um, yes, we can. We're an essential business. Number two, the parks are open and we can be out here. Number three, we're following all the recommendations and guidelines for even us doing our own personal area. Mm -hmm. What this would be like. And so I realized really anyone that was a naysayer, or anyone that wanted to jump on us, I go, you're just not our target demographic. You're not who we're looking for. Yeah. Because everyone in the park that saw us, they're like, this is the wave of the future. This is what's going on next. Because I could be there with five of my friends and six feet away, have another five friends and six feet away. And my headsets go a thousand feet. That's great. That's and so, that. and I could have multiple genres of music playing. So there could be something for everyone there. Mm -hmm. uh, it gives artists a way to play to a crowd of people. Uh, they can actually see and have that experience. Um, but yeah, we're not breaking any laws. We're not breaking any rules, you know? So it's it's going to be tough for these businesses to open back up, you know, that, that definitely, I think in the article, the, the, the quote was, we're in the business of packing people into our establishments, yeah. not limiting the amount of people that can come in. And is a show, you're right, are they going to charge a thousand bucks a person? I mean, and, and then with, with all the artists jumping on board with live streaming, that's a whole new gambit in itself that they could say, I mean, everyone's doing live streaming for free right now. Well, they're getting the bits and the emojis and, and that kind of stuff where people were asking for donations in the past. But one of the conversations that we're having now, I would have had this conversation last year as well is, okay, you're an A-list celebrity DJ for me to bring you to town would say normally be $5,000 plus your writer. They, just say it's thousands of dollars to bring them down. And uh, plus your rider, your airfare, what other stuff. It may cost you $10,000 to bring somebody to the town. Sure. But if I want you to perform an exclusive set on my show, what does that pay look like? Do I do 10%? Do I do 20%? Do I, I – nobody's having that conversation yet. And here's the other problem is let's say I do want to get that exclusive set from somebody or that exclusive mix, that DJ performance – Will people buy tickets to my show if they've already been running three days a week doing it for free? Right. right. And now how do I monetize and get my money back if I want to do a pay-per-view? Or do I have to split the pay-per-view with the artist? And some of these artists, they might just say, you know what? If they could go live and play to 20,000 people or 10,000 people and get five, five bucks a pop and they're getting 50 grand a week, do they really need to tour anymore? I mean, it'll be nice to go see them live and in person, but they can do that in conjunction with their tour as well. So in their downtime, they used to be in the studio working on tracks or music, mm -hmm. but now they can go into a studio like uh, R90 Lighting, where we did um, the first ever drive-through raves in America. 
think they were done over in the UK first, but we were the first ones to do them here. I worked on all three productions of those. Um, you know, they went and built a studio, like a, a full on, if you were to rent all this lighting gear, it cost you about 20, 25,000 in rental. Gotcha. Fees. Yeah. Uh, Cause they just had all their lighting up in their warehouse. So in their warehouse, they built a virtual stage and, um, you know, we did a show there for Halloween, a uh, freak stream. And it was just, it was awesome. Went off the hook. We I think we took number four in the world when we were on Twitch, maybe nice. five or six, you know, we're, we're constantly always hitting in that top 10 up there, but the level of production was kind of, was big, you know, it was mm -hmm. awesome. So, you know, you got those kind of costs going into things. The people that can keep this going are one in like insomniac or live nation or AEG. They can do something with these virtual concerts. Um, and you might see that happening. It might be, it might go, Hey, we're going to stream this concert live and you're going to be able to buy well, in-person yeah, tickets. I have experience it. with that. So, you know, the band fish P H I S H. Yeah. Fish. Mm -hmm. right, so I've seen fish 141 times. Right. So when I got out of my Nirvana phase, my, my, you know, I started going to see fish from 93, 94, like 20, 30 times a year, 95 summer. I did the whole tour, sold burritos out of a back of a VW bus, <laughs> had five bucks in Idaho, no tickets to any of the shows. I saw 30 shows, met them just selling burritos after the show to, to stone, folks. It was great. Right. So, but point being, so fish does a different show every night, right? They, do, oh, okay. they can cover everybody. They've covered Michael Jackson. They've covered Miles Davis. They've covered the beastie boys. So I have seen them do sabotage, right? So, um, that, that we want to see something different every night. So that's why we go so many times. They started live streaming all of their shows, right? So webcast, we'll webcast, yep. watch it on your 50 inch, right? So I've been paying 20 bucks, 25 bucks for 10 years. You know, if I can't go to a new year's show, Buy it, sit home, no line in the bathroom, you know, six back cost me 10 bucks instead of, you know, 10, 15, you know, I've adjusted to that. Now, yes, it's, it's 80% of the excitement, well, maybe a little less, you know, I'm, I, I'm having seen them 141 times. It's, you know, I can wow. conjure up <laughs> that feeling quick, you know, but the, the uniqueness of why I want to see it every time I get right. So I've been kind of accepting that input for a long time. And I think people have a hard time adjusting to that because it's not the same. And most mm -hmm. people haven't seen anybody 141 times, right? To be able to kind of recreate that experience for myself. Now, what Trey did, the lead singer this year, which kind of brings two things we've been talking to together through Twitch, he rented the Beacon Theater or, or took over the Beacon Theater and he did a, did a show every Friday night for eight weeks in a row. Okay. All right. It was free. Obviously, Twitch probably gave him a ton of money or whatever, you know, however they made it work. But that was kind of, you know, there was nobody, there was no audience. It was actually weird because he was facing the back of the, of the stage. Like the, like the way it was set up, they had the lights all where the, where the seats would be. And it was, it was, but it didn't look that way. You only saw that when it went behind the scenes, but mm -hmm. again, readjusting, there was nobody. In, so maybe the next phase of that is you have 500 people in the audience in a 4,000 seat place paying top dollar. Right? And you have someone like me paying 10 bucks or 15 bucks from home. And you do it at, at more of a residency or semi residency, right? So everybody does residencies in Vegas. Maybe they all start doing them everywhere. You go somewhere, you stay there for a month, <laughs> park it, you know, like you get your, you get your bracelet to make sure you're safe and tested, whatever that is for the next year or two, right? It's going to take a, it's at least that so we can get maybe close to not worrying about it. And, and yeah, so, that's going to be the, the big industry. I mean, it, it, it definitely catapulted it, 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 it exponential. I, I don't even know if exponentially would be the right word to use. It is, but it wasn't like, oh, it just doubled by a factor of two. I mean, it did see the double of the growth, but I mean, it really just, and I know from the, from the top level artists to, to the, the, just starting out brand new, I got into this business. They're all clamoring for that attention. Yeah. And when somebody finally gets down to it and dials it down, they're going to go, okay, well, will there be there? The dust will settle. Somebody, they will start monetizing it. Or I see a lot of our, our artists now on their Twitch channel you can only watch their Twitch channel if you're subscribed to it. So you got to put together, yeah, you got to give them that 499 or that 2499 to even be let in to watch any of the content on their channel, which is what's crazy because they're all using copyrighted music. They don't have the rights to. <laughs> and I, I can tell you, unfortunately, Twitch is going to start cracking down. Yeah. I, I, he, I, I actually just was talking with this about the, I was just talking about this with Mick, Mixcloud on Monday and I'll be interviewing one of the co-founders of Mixcloud because he heard my interview. Actually a friend of his sent him a podcast that I was on talking to a kid about copyright. Then in that 
interview that I did, I had done an interview previous to that second interview with an attorney out of LA, Gordon Firemark, the podcast lawyer. He went back and listened to both of those episodes and he reached out to me and said, Darren, I want to be interviewed on your show. Oh, hey. The guy from Mixa, yeah. And I said, okay, this is cool. And, um, you know, so I, I had told him, he goes, I want to know more about this French company that is supposed to be working with Twitch to develop a new algo to start monitoring the live streams. Ah. And so people didn't understand this last year I was watching and I came out about two years ago on Facebook and I did not make any friends for this one. Um, and I said, Hey everyone, it was, it was a joke post. I was completely being facetious and joking, but they, people just took it and ran okay. seriously with it. And I said, Hey everyone, I just want to let you all know something. If you're using copywritten music and you're, um, not getting the licensing for it, you are a criminal. And I go, and guess what? I'm a criminal too. Huh? Literally said it, called myself out. Here's the thing. The community up here in Seattle just, who the heck does this guy think he is? This yeah. asshole calling us criminal. And I'm like, <laughs> I was a joke. It was yeah. a joke that, yes, now we've worked on our license. I, I spent, so when everyone jumped online, uh, we were actually this time last year, I was in talks to Twitch to get put back to the front page of their site. I was talking to the music acquisition team there. And I, the guy who got me on in content acquisition, he moved out of his department. He now works with all top level A-list celebrities, kind of got a promotion, really cool guy. But the new team, these two people, um, I was talking to them and said, hey, we're, we're getting ready to fire back up. 2020 is coming around. We want to get back to the front page of Twitch because we were in a big lull for years because in 18, uh, I was supposed to get a new website built, launch the whole brand. That took way longer than what it was supposed to take and what it was supposed to take. And so if you look at our Twitch growth, we came on in like May of 2018 and we were on the front page of Twitch and all this. And then it went down to almost like nothing. Yeah. Because I wasn't pushing anything because I wanted the website done before I pushed the brand. Right. And late 19, I just said, screw it. We're coming out of beta. We're doing it. Bring it. Website can be broken. I don't care. And so you started seeing the rise of us, but then we were coming into a hundred events. We had contracts with the city of Seattle to do events for them, our silent disco events. We had a truck we were going to be running, tons of stuff. And um, so I was talking with Twitch and they're like, okay, Darren, here's the thing. If we put you to the front page of our site, you have to have the licensing for all the music you're going to be putting up because we are, we will actively be promoting that show. When we put you, it's not like a, Oh, look, we just came across this and put this up on the front. They plan that placement. They people pay 50 to a hundred thousand dollars to get two hours on the front page of Twitch. Yeah. Okay. And they're just going to give it to us as they're one of their only featured live streaming DJ shows, mm -hmm. feature partner shows. So what happens is uh, they go, and that's great if you get the licensing for those, for that show, but you got 400 videos on our server here and uh, you don't get the licensing for those. Well, not on our platform anyways, because you got to get permit. Uh -oh. So they said, here's the can of worms that could happen. You have a great show here and we go to the front of our site and you got 20,000 people watching your show. Great. But those labels, they can come back after you for your past shows. Not only that, they can go to your website to your other past 1300 episodes. Mm. Thank you for all that. And I went, oh, oh boy. Yeah. Yeah. So I had to go back and remove all our videos from Twitch go back and talk up and work on all our licensing, do everything we could do to get our servers backed up. So our shows were going and and that's when everyone just went, let's jump online in a world where it was an event driven event based world. Here we are being a streaming partner, streaming, streaming, streaming. And everyone else goes and jumps on board and starts live streaming when we're actually trying to get into the event world and start yeah. throwing events with our silent disco event. That's crazy. It was almost a completely reversal yeah. on the, the industry shifting. And uh, it was, yeah, but who, it would was have who the hell would have expected it? How could well, you ever, you know, and then, I mean, of course it was like, oh, in two weeks, this will go away in two months, this will go away. And pretty much when, you know, when it hit into summer, I'm like, okay, we, well, so here's what happened to us. So we came in, um, first, all the parks were closed down. So you, you weren't even supposed to be at a park and I didn't want to do anything to jeopardize my contracts with the city. So mm -hmm. I'm like, we'll wait and figure this out. So then it was about April ish. When we, when the, when the whole proclamation in our state came out and said, this is what an essential business is. And this, that, and I read through the black and white and said, Hey, the way our business is registered as a media based production company, you we fall under this caveat and this caveat we're in cool. We can still do our thing. Had to wait for parks to open up. 
and um, had the news teams come out and they were, we were just getting ready to start our shows up in March and um, uh, something. Okay. So there was two things that happened and um, well, yeah, I mean, COVID happened <laughs> and that kind of shut us down. But then we came back. That's what that's what it was. So that happened, and then I was trying to get this timeline right. And then we came back in May after we found out we were an essential business, and we started doing events, and the protests started happening. Ah, and I was like, "Oh, where do I really fit in in all of this? Should I be promoting good times, silent disco events over here? Or should I be turning my media skills and channeling over here and finding what my role in this momentous part of history is going to be?" Right, and kind of searched through that for a few months. And then said, you know what, after, after weaving through the system, I just said, you know what, I got to get back to doing what I'm doing. I got a company to run. I, we can do this. It's July. Let's start back up and get out in the parks and start doing our events again. Right. And there was a, a, a nice little fun adversary group, we'll say, that uh, <laughs> took one of my commercials that I ran. And, you know, people don't ever like doing any homework when we have this wonderful thing called the internet to go look up anything ever. They just want to point a finger and try to put people on blast and shame them and all that fun stuff. And, you know, if anyone would have ever come up to me and asked, it's like, here, we're writing the playbook. This is, this has been delivered to people at key city elements the, they, the cops would come out on us like three times. The cops come out like, what are you doing here? They go, we're doing our thing. We can be here. And they'd be like, you know what? There are no rules. You can, yeah. you know, yeah. you're, you're doing everything by the book, doing it right. And here you go. And as a matter of fact, we see people, because they do what's called renegade parties or they do these pop or they're called COVID COVID spreader parties or whatever, you know, people just trying to shame them because they're all getting together and partying. I'm like, that's not how our operation is run. Mm. Um, you know, I have some people that come to me sometimes and they'll be like, well, how do you make sure everyone's wearing a mask? I go, we're at a public park. I can't control that. You know, that's impossible for me to even try to do that. I could, we can say mask up, but if somebody wants to be out there, if it was a closed event that had access that I could kick people out, that's a different right. story. But right. we're at a public park. Right. And, you right. know, actually it says in the rules, if you're out in a public park and you're six feet away from somebody or you're working out or doing dancing or anything like that, you don't have to wear a mask. So, <laughs> you know, at least just a lot of people's opinions come in the way of things. And we just trying to make sure that we're able to still have a shared collective music experience the people can still have a shared collective music experience because they really need it we're mm -hmm. actually coming into um we did a, a press release a few months back and it was actually we were bringing in going to start bringing in uh, yoga and light uh, athletic workouts mm -hmm. you know, over one of our channels so people can come out and kind of work out in a group of people because all the gyms were closed um we have a, we have a new series we'll be launching called the flow sessions uh, i'm really excited for that one basically uh, if you ever see the the dancers at events that have the, the glow toys sure. that yeah. swing and do all that. Absolutely. So flow arts, uh, we have a flow team. We're going to be working very closely with. That'll be part of our productions and we're producing a new show, a training series that they'll train how to do flow and then take an hour off of the show and kind of just dance and then go back and do another hour of instruction, just getting people out of the house, getting them moving, getting them doing That's something. I'd be breakthrough. So a year ago at this time, um, you know, after New Year's, my wife and I went through a resolution. In the first three months, I lost like 25 pounds at the gym, 5 a.m. every day, sometimes back at 5 p.m., like kicking ass, taking names, feeling great. I haven't been to the gym now in like nine months. Right. And it's more mental. Right. Can I work out with a mask? Do I want to be around? I was, I was nervous at first. I cut it. I was like, you know, I belong to a great gym with a spa and a hot tub. And I was like, I'm not getting in a hot tub spa. Oh, you know, so I mean, but I, th I think I'm ready now. I think now I'm ready to go back to the gym to be safe about it. And to, you know, so, and, and, Obviously, the people that, that have, you know, real, real like mental uh, agoraphobia or things like that, that it's just exacerbated so much. I can only imagine how they're dealing with it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and this is me after a year. So I'm excited. Every time I, time I drive by Planet Fitness, I'm like, I'm coming to get you. And, hey, uh, and I'm a Planet Fitness member, too. Oh, oh yeah. I'm gonna, I think I'm going to join this week. It's, it's, they, um, uh, they just ran a special. They opened one two blocks from my place, and yeah. uh, it was the $10 a month. I was like, I can't beat that. If I go to the gym three times a week. Yeah. It's 80 cents to go to the gym. Yeah. And it, For me, now, it wasn't the cost. It was, the, it was the mental. Like, I didn't want to be yeah. around people. I didn't think I'd be comfortable with a mask. And I still don't know. You know, working out with a mask is going to kind of suck. But I'm going to do it because I have to because 
I can't wait three years to go to a gym <laughs> you know, or four years. It's like, I got to yeah. get back into it. Cause it's, it's, you know, it affects you physically and mentally and spiritually and mm-hmm. every other way. I'm not out there rocking at shows. If you're not out there, at least if I go to the gym and listen to Metallica and Slayer for, you know, a half hour and, you know, rage against the machine and then <laughs> get some exactly. yayas out, you know? So yeah, I think I'm taking a turn. I feel, I'm feeling a little hopeful, I'm feeling more hopeful now. Um, you know, things going on in the world. Uh, you know, I think we're, 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 we're going to fill it more with love and with uh, good vibrations in this year than we have in the last couple. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I feel like we're turning. We're turning in, 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 a, in a lot of ways. And, and I feel like I am too. Uh, you know, my wife got vaccinated. She works in the medical field. Nice. Uh, my parents got the first half of the vaccination. You know, I'm going to try to get mine, get, get, get on the calendar if I can. You know, mm-hmm. I know that um, uh, CVS and Walgreens, now the, the pharmacies are now going to be getting more um, – vaccine to be able to distribute oh. to communities. So hopefully, you know, a lot of people out there will start getting it more readily available. Um, I heard today 10%, 10% of the population in the U.S. is actually, maybe they received the first vaccine. Okay. 10% received the first the first shot. So we're getting there, right? If double digits of the first shot, it's, you know, we need 60%, I guess, for herd, right? So we're a long way, but let's get out there, get it. You know, people yeah. are worried about it, just go out. And, and I've never had a flu shot. And I, I even saw my doctor four months ago, five months ago. And I was like, should I get it? She's like, you should get a flu shot just in case you get sick. They, they'd be able to tell it. And I mean, I still haven't, but I'm getting this vaccine because mm-hmm. I'm not looking mm-hmm. around because I need live music and I need to get out and be around people more because it's, we're not meant to live like this. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, it definitely, you know, um, the toll, it, it's definitely taken a toll on many people. Obviously we've heard. Um, and it, it is just tragic. And that's, why when I made my decision to still move forward with our oh, event. Yeah, Mike Imperata, sorry, my, friend, my buddy said Mike said hi on the chat. Yeah, Mike, what's up? Hey, Mike, how's it going, man? Hey, Mike. He's coming on in a month. He'll be back on the show. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, we, we decided, I said, you know what? I know that we're, the people that are going to come at me, they are not reading what we've read. Everything's there in black and white. You know, we've checked it, double checked it. I'm not going out and trying to do something illegal. I'm not trying to go out there and break the rules. I'm following the guidelines, just like a restaurant, just like a grocery store. I am a business owner. I own an LLC or no, it's a nonprofit charitable organization to full corp. I own a corporation that basically we are following the rules. And if you're going to sit here and shame me, then you're basically shaming every other business out there that's even open to do anything. No, man. And, and, and you can't, if you do that, then, you know, I, I get people want this to go away. They want it to get, get through it, but some of us have businesses we have to run. I have investors. I have money. I have stuff that I put in. I can't just let this. They said one in eight businesses in America closed for good last year. Yeah. 17%. And that number's still going up. I mean, there's, I just heard of other nightclubs in our city going under. No, the spaces are still going to be there. It's just those owners aren't in business. Somebody's going to come by with their Bitcoin money and you go, yeah, I'll start a bar up. Let's go. Right, right. You know, but well, we got to find a way to work, make it work for more businesses. Uh, and I mean, you yeah. know, it's, it's tough. It's, it's, but you don't want, I don't know. You don't want to get too aggressive on the other end, but I mean, you know, I appreciate everywhere I go. I, I notice how much more diligent everybody is with cleaning. Every time I walk into the grocery store, if someone's not, people aren't standing around, they're either stocking or cleaning. You know, the guy in the deli was scrubbing and scrubbing and everybody's, you know, really taking those extra precautions to make it safe for people. Mm-hmm. Right? So now we need to kind of start extending that out more. I think, you know, now that I think we've really just recently turned the corner though, where we can start doing that. Um, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's tough. And, and there's no, there's no, it's, they say it's science, but it's not exact science. This is all swags. That, so we hope another million people don't die. Right. We really don't know because a million people could have died if we opened things up nine months ago. Maybe not though. We'll never know. <laughs> yeah. The, the tough thing is, is, um, you know, I think the tough thing for a small business owner, yeah, if you're sitting there in your own Target or your own Macy's or, you know, these major stores that can take a hit like this, basically, um, they're okay. But if you're the, the local business that, that, that can't sustain yourself, I mean, without foot traffic, um, then um, did you lose me? Can you hear me? I can, I hear you. I got you. I'm frozen. I'm frozen somehow. I don't know why my, it's my frozen. <laughs> I can All hear right. you. I'm moving. I'm, I feel like All a right, cat. Cool. Like no, a I mean, cat. Just, like cat. I am moving. Just, I'm alive. You know, um, I was just saying that basically 
as a business owner, you, you have to make decisions and sometimes, and a business is not a guarantee either, but, but, you know, not sure. getting support. Entertainment was the first to shut down. They've been saying this first to shut down will be the last to come back. Right. And that's just the, the truth of it. And, you know, I've seen companies that have been around for 20 years are gone. Yeah. Um, just cause they, they couldn't do it or they packed up all their stuff, put it in shipping containers and went traveling, you know, yeah. um, just well, to say you've seen like smaller businesses in towns that have been around for 20, 30 years and they're closing. Cause you know, mm -hmm. they just, I mean, you can't sustain nine months of nothing. It's yeah. just, it's well, impossible. that's the difficult thing. That's what I was going to get into is, is, you know, you look at something like this and you know, in our state, people keep shaking a stick at, at our governor, governor Inslee, because he keeps switching the market, the mar the marker, you right. know, it's like, oh, here's this, and then we're gonna go with this, and then we're gonna all go. The with governors, this. All the governors are doing that. Our yeah. governors are doing it it's yeah. tough. So it's tough. There's no right answer. It's and no, it's it sucks. It just sucks all yeah. around. That's the bottom. <laughs> <though. laughs> um, but well, again, we're 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 happy. I mean, I'm going out to Queen Anne Beer Hall tonight to go talk with the owner there about our new brunch series. We'll be starting up um, cool. every every Saturday from twelve to four. Uh, streaming live from the Queen on Beer Hall. They got it's oh, neat. It's yeah. They got these big. They got some big projectors there, so we can actually put our live stream up on the big projectors, uh -huh. and then people could. We don't need to bring in the amplified music because we'll be using our silent disco technology there, so people can still come in, have a great brunch experience. But if they want to listen to this live DJ show that's being produced, they right. can put on the headsets and then sit, see how you know that we're number like ten in the world. Be like, that's being filmed right here. This is one of the world's largest or. That's pretty cool. DJ shows like yeah, yeah. but but this also launches us into like silent disco sports and other shows so I can put the other TV channels on the silent disco headsets so it's gonna open up a lot of things I like pushing technology to different areas you know yeah. and, and oh, so great. um I'm like I said earlier uh, I'm a foodie and one of my favorite places to go is always the all you can eat buffet because then I can get <laughs> A little of this and a little of that and a little of this and a little of that and have a nice big plate of food um and uh so when when i can have that kind of in a music experience um i i love it we're actually looking at getting uh, about 300 to 800 more headsets this year and we're going to add nine channels to them Jeez. how many headsets yeah. do you have now in your uh 200 200. Okay, we started okay. with 200. We, we were going to let last year roll through with our contract to the city and see what that was. I was actually planning to get 300 to 800 more last year, but then okay. <laughs> it didn't, happen. That didn't really yeah. happen last yeah. year. But um, yeah, being able to basically throw a festival with all the performers pretty much on the same stage, I think it's going to be a feat in itself. And I don't know anyone that's really ever booked an A-list celebrity DJ to come play silent disco events. I mean, I'm sure it's happened before, um, but in Seattle, not not that I know of. And there's only, well, there were three or four of us. Now there's just me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but cool. um, they, they weren't- be the first. Yeah, they weren't booking headliner shows. And then uh, the ability to also stream live on site, on location, that was another cost and half. It runs me about 120 to $150 for every, four hours of video um, that I stream when I'm out at a park or huh. when I'm driving the truck around. I had to go buy what I call the, the backpack uh -huh. um, piece of technology from um, from Teradek. Are you familiar with that company? Yep. So bought a Teradek bond and backpack and uh, that was a nice little $7,000 setback so I could stream <laughs> live and not have to do it over a cell phone. And I, I, I yeah. So that's just some of our other initial costs that, you know, we right. have to figure out how we have to accommodate this, how we're going to make those costs happen. Now I still want to make it affordable. I don't want to go out and charge, you know, $70 for a silent disco headset. Our price point on these things are usually 10 bucks a pop. So, you know, and then just trying to find that right audience that, that is looking for that shared music experience. So we got a lot of winning stuff on our side that, that we're looking forward to launch for 2021. And you're right. The, the, things are loosening up in the sense that we're feeling more positive, I would say. Right. Um, right. Which is going to come into a lot of favor for the overall health and well being of people. And we, but we need to get out there. We need to be communal and we need to dance and shake our asses too. Right. So it, it's, it's, but I don't want to get COVID shaking my ass either. Nope. <laughs>
<laughs> nope, 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 nope. I like I said, I, I I have a whole setup where we rope ourselves off. Yeah. It's only a me a and a, there's a definite way to do yeah. it, man. You know, that's, and that's what we want to show people that there, there is a safe way to do this. Um, you know, I have people that are pointing fingers at, at us, people that are pointing fingers at other people, but then they don't point fingers at their friends for doing the same thing. Right. That right. double standard type stuff that's out there, or they'll go and party and they'll, they'll shame other people, but they won't shame themselves. Mm -hmm. And it's like, mm, no, not cool. so yeah, music, music, music is uh, my life, I guess you could say. And uh, now I, I, I'm finding myself being an events planner that's now planning the shows. That's another feather in the sock. I, I was supposed to be a videographer. And it's always supposed to be working with the promoters, working with the nightclubs, working with the concert, the entertainment companies, the, the PR people, all that. <laughs> now I've got to do it all. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't mind it. I don't mind it. It's, it's a rush. It, it definitely is fun. That's cool. Well, you can tell it's a passion if you've done it for this long and, and you're so damn good at it and you've <laughs> been able to bring uh, you know unique elements together. And I, I think that's kind of what I've got out of my season one. You know, I was able to, and, and, uh, and mutually beneficial, right? For me, the guests, and then whoever out there, whoever else might listen is kind of the gravy, right? But if me and the guests have a good time and then and you're able to vibrate some love and some, some positivity out there, then fucking do it. You know, that's... <laughs> There you go. And that's, that's yeah. yeah. Speaking of positivity, I don't know what's going on with my camera. I think it's completely shit to bed. It's a new so, GoPro. I can't get it hooked up at all. My, I don't know. my friends and I, every Friday night for the past few months, we've been doing the, the Zoom dance parties. Have you ever done one of those yet? No. Uh, well, I did I did a Zoom happy hour dance party with my buddies when I first got into this, <laughs> which was the vibe that I love. But tell me more. Do tell me more. Yeah, so on Friday nights from like a, maybe like 7 o'clock, we'll all jump onto a Zoom together. Usually it's me and like seven or eight other girls. I, I think I'm like the only guy from our friends group that gets into these things. <laughs> there have been some crazy moments. It's been some fun stuff. Yeah. But uh, I will pull the whole uh, – And you've, it's oh. it's the fake it's the fake freeze the on fake freeze. yeah 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 the I fake freeze. <laughs> oh I'm doing the real freeze <laughs> so just, I'm still trying to get mine out oh <laughs> no it's just, it's just some fun right stuff now. it hasn't even it won't come back so I think I might have to give up on my camera coming back tonight I think that's it I think this frozen mic is all you're getting um well but hey Darren you know what this has been a lot of fun my brother yeah yeah, yeah man, definitely. So my first live episode, obviously a little technical failure at the end. Something had to go wrong. It had. You to. know, that's the one thing I love, Mike, <laughs> about live streaming. I always told everyone, it doesn't matter what happens, just keep going. Yeah, hey, just, it is what just, it is. Just keep going because you know it's live. It's not pre-recorded. It's not edited. And out of all the mediums I had done in the past, the thrill and rush. I mean, it's still there for me. I mean, I'm sort yeah. of desensitized to it now. Yeah, yeah. But like I was telling my friend the other day. I could wake up out of bed, one eye closed, both hands tied behind my back, hopping on one foot with, you know, whistling Dixie, and I could live stream. Yeah. That's how much of this stuff I did. Like, that, they, I'm desensitized well, to it, but I still get a rush from I tried, doing, I tried it. doing it. I tried doing it twice in my first season, live streaming, right? Mm -hmm. And when I did it, both times I had multiple guests, and my, nobody could hear them. So they could hear me, but couldn't hear my guest. So it was an mm -hmm. unedible situation. Like I could not continue. So I had mm -hmm. to cut the live stream, just record it, and then post it later. Mm -hmm. So I did it once. It was an early episode. It was like the sixth episode out of, out of the 160. So I was like, all right, I'm not doing that again. Someone bitched. They're like, oh, my God, you know, I wanted to watch this, and I couldn't hear I was like, all right, sorry, I won't do that again. All right, so I didn't try again for like 70 episodes, and I tried again, and the same fucking thing happened. <laughs> so you couldn't hear my guest. I was like, all right, now I'm really giving it up. Um, but now I have a different platform, right? Using you, uh, our, um, yeah, restream, uh, mm -hmm. account, but I still found a way to screw it up. <laughs> there we go. Things happen. You know, it's funny when, before restream, I actually, back in the day wanted to get, a, I wanted the stream to live stream, you stream and Justin TV. I was going to have to have a separate computer for each one. Then I had to have bandwidth for each one. Right. But that right. way I could go to multiple platforms at the same time. And that's what I really loved when I found, came across that's restream yeah, last year, I was like, the this bomb. is the bee's knees. Yeah. Unfortunately, unfortunately, my deal with Twitch, I'm not allowed to stream to multiple platforms or put my episodes uh, up for 24 hours. Right. Um, but I think we might have a way around that. <laughs> Where there's a will, there's a way around it. <laughs> well, Mixcloud doesn't have the the, the same things oh, in, their, in their feature partnership. So I was like, okay, cool. Um, little little, got to get a little creative on some some angles, and so it's not the same content 
Right, right, right. All right, so, so Darren, yeah. short-term goals. What are we going to see from you before the end of the month? What's what short-term uh, short-term I'm coming for you? Oh, we are launching the brand new website, thedjsessions.com. Uh, it is going to happen what? this month. It is going to happen this month. Absolutely. Right. I'm. I'm. I mean, I'd say right now about it's 90, 93 percent of the static work is done. Cool. It's now figuring out how we're going to get about seventeen hundred episodes in just the, into the site. And I uh, work working with the dev team. I mean, I can do them one at a time. But even if we did twenty of them, if I was able to do one every two to three minutes. <laughs> Right. You can see how it's going to take a look. What we're going to do is we're going to ingest the A. We'll keep the other website up. I do have a way I can showcase the past 300 episodes through an embeddable player right now. Um, but I'm going to start bringing in all the past A list celebrity episodes. Sure, start first. at the top. Yeah, start at the top. And, um, and then start bringing in the other names and the other brands and, and start going through because it, 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 we've got it working. It looks brilliant. It's perfect. Um, but yeah, there's a way I can. I might be able to grab, I don't know if you're a WordPress guy or not, but um, no, I could no. export something, basically export import. If I can okay. do this, my problems are solved. And I'll be like, yes. Right. But um, but yeah, it check it out. Maybe another week tops. I'm super excited about that. And then, yeah, this brunch series, every Tuesday we go live from the Waterland Arcade. Cool. Um, that's a great, it's a fun time. We're, we're actually our set is a video game arcade. Nice. Like all these old, we, we actually set up in what I, well, I nicknamed it a few weeks ago, the pinball lounge. So we're set up in the pinball oh, machine yeah, area yeah. with the pinballs. Really cool. People can come in and actually play pinball while we're doing the show live. Awesome. And uh, there's all sorts of old school video games there. Um, and that's, that's a really fun show. And then, uh, yeah, just getting things back to, the weather's going to warm up. We're going to start getting the truck back out again. And uh, there's some little picture or something there. Yeah, I'm playing with my graphics. There's my camera oh. graphic and <laughs> the new studio. I'm in the new hey. studio. Hey, restream. Oh, really? oh, there's me. There's my head. You can crush my head. Oh, I can't, I can't do that. I'm backwards. I don't know. <laughs> oh, we used to get really crazy. I, I mean, I see a lot of the people doing live streaming right now. That stuff I was doing 10 years ago to play around with yeah. and look at this and look at this and look at this. And I see everyone doing that. And I'm like, yeah, I used to be right. I, yeah. My shows used to look just like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, season two, yes. episode one. And I froze up for the last uh, quarter of it in my face. What are you going to do? Hey, you know, I'll, 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 I'll freeze with you. Hey. <laughs> Hey man, it's been a lot of fun. I really appreciate you coming on and, and, and spending some time with me. Absolutely. Um, we can see that new Ferrari website. <laughs> I'd definitely be checking that out. Um, and yeah, let's let's have you back on here again when uh, maybe we can uh, I can be a moving moving figure again, a moving picture. Definitely would love that. And uh, you know, we are still that road trip is still planned. The freeway cool. session is still planned, and New York is on our radar. Oh, dude, get out there, dude, You gotta tell me. I'm I'm 50 miles north of the city, so you come anywhere, you know, Jersey, Connecticut, New York, anywhere in this area, tell me. And awesome, we will do. Yeah, we'll hook up. All right, cool. That's I'll fun. talk to you later. All right, thanks a lot for coming on. Have a great rest of the day. Night. You as well. Good evening.